evening. The May 19th meeting of the Gilroy Unified School District Board of Education will come to order. Hay alguien aquí que necesita intérprete para la junta? No hay. This meeting is being recorded or broadcasted images and sounds may be captured of those attending this meeting. We will start with the Pledge of Allegiance and would our student rep please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Ready, stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, please see. I'll entertain a motion for approval of our agenda. Um, there are a few, excuse me, I had to turn that on. There's a few items uh, that I wanna mention. Um, we wanna remove 12N and that'll come back on the next agenda. And then three wait, items. Wait, 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 wait. Oops, sorry. That's what I was told. 12H. I can't read my own writing. 12H. <laughs> okay. And then Ms. Nelson's requested three items be pulled we'll from the consent agenda. Each one. Okay. I will accept the um, approval of our agenda minus item 12H. So moved. Yeah, that goes. Twenty second. Okay, and this is a roll call vote. All of our uh, votes tonight will be roll call because we have Trustee Good um, electronically. Melissa Gary. Almost ready. Yes. Enrique Diaz. Yes. Quincy Yes. Mark Good. Yes. Michelle Nelson. Yes. Tate. Yes. Linda Pacino. Yes. We will go to item three C. Our recognition. Thank Superintendent you. Flores. Uh, Welcome, everyone. I imagine some of you are in the boardroom for the first time. So thank you for being here. Uh, to support and appreciate some amazing young people that we're going to recognize tonight. We're very excited uh, about this recognition about community service. This is something very close to our board and me, um, something we started a number of years ago and it's been an incredible success. So I'd like the students to come in and line up over here. Just line up all the way in front of the, the board. <laughs> How many students are here? 26? Probably all of them are the way over here. So board members, there are actually 39 uh, that sort of put in more than 160 hours, but we have 26 here tonight. So I'm gonna go ahead and start while they finish lining up. So tonight, the District and Board of Education have the pleasure of honoring some very special members of the class of 2022 who earned the highest number of community service hours at each of our four high schools in our district during their high school careers. The district's community service requirement first began with the graduating class of 2014. The board instituted this requirement in, in an effort to instill in our students the value of community involvement and service to others. When students are given the opportunity to work on pressing community problems or address the needs of different segments of our population, they contribute positively to the quality, the quality of our community. In a typical year, high school students in the Gilroy Unified School District are required to perform um, 80 hours of community service. But as you know, the last two years weren't typical years. So we temporarily reduced the requirement during those years, but we did not um, eliminate the requirement that I'm gonna talk about now. Students who double the 80 hours of service, uh, of service to 160 hours or more are honored at their graduation ceremonies 
with a special cord to wear along with their cap and gown. In fact, the last two nights, uh, they uh, were asked to stand at the senior award ceremonies. In spite of a global pandemic, this group of students still achieved the requirement and earned more than 160 hours. Well done, students. That's really remarkable. When you think about you were in distance learning for over a year, so it's incredible. With the success of the program over the last several years, the district be began also honoring the top 5% of students who have earned the most community service hours from the graduating class of each school site. Students must have earned at least 160 hours to qualify for that distinction. The individual with the highest number of community service hours at each school will also have their name engraved on a perpetual plaque that is prominently displayed at each school site. And we're gonna recognize those tonight. So tonight we honor those students have, who have far exceeded the community service requirements set forth by the district. The hours they completed are in the top 5% of each of their high schools. There are 19 students from Christopher High, four from Gekka, 15 from Gilroy High, and one from Mount Madonna High. And as I said, 26 of those 39 are here tonight. I applaud the 39 students who have completed over 9,877 service hours during their high school careers, with the highest being 651.9 hours. We'll see that person shortly. In total, the class of 2022, that's all students in that class, completed 56,744 community service hours throughout their high school careers. Just think of the impact on our community. This is such a great example of how small, small acts make a tremendous impact on our world. I'd also like to thank the teachers from each side whose leadership and vision has supported the growth of the community service program and allowed it to flourish. I, did I say teachers, leaders? I'm talking about the principals. So I wanna acknowledge the four principals. I don't know if they're all four here, but I wanna acknowledge them. This hasn't been an easy program to implement and they've been totally behind it. So Jeremy Dirks from Christopher High School, Greg Capacu from Gilroy High, Sonia Flores from Gekka, and Diane Padilla from Mount Madonna. Thank you all for your support. The people that really make this happen though at the school are the community service coordinators for each of the four high schools. They play such a vital role in the success of this program. And I wanna call the four of them out. And if they're here, ask them to come up. Gretchen Yoder Schrock from Christopher High School. I know I saw her. Rebecca Plaza from Gekka. Lauren Montani from Gilroy High. And Carmen Salgado from Mount Madonna High School. Thank you. I don't know. If Anywhere. <laughs> it takes a huge amount of time and effort to coordinate the community service program. So thank you both so much. And the other two who are not here without your dedication, this program wouldn't be the success it is. So now I'm gonna call out the names of the 26 people, students who are here uh, by school. Okay, just had another one arrive, cool. Okay, so I'll start with Christopher. Hi, where is Christopher lined up? Right here, cool, all right. As I say your name, if you would just take a small step forward, that way the audience knows who you are. So Skylar Torillo, Annabella Velasquez Castro, is she here, no? Nathan Zavaleta, is he here, good. Yeah. Alexander Bloyer, Alisa Lan Burdick, Carly Camarillo, Lydia Nsambe Monpaco, Emily High, Alexis Kong, Ruth Nathan Javier, Adrian Palomares Marino, Guadalupe Ramos, Isabel Romero, Sean Steven. Yashila Suresh, Ariel Trujillo. That's Christopher High. Congratulations, Christopher High. The Gekka students, Gekka, where are you? Okay, right in the middle. All right, Layla Basabe, 
Priet, um, sorry, let me say that again. Leila Batabe Aguilar Prieto. Maricel Cruz Velasco. Hannah Fujita. Elisa Gonzalez. Congratulations, Gekka seniors. And now Gilroy Hyde, where are you on that end? All right. Brandy Garcia Perez, Hector Lara Lacona, Teddy Opredi. Are you stepping forward when I say your name? <laughs> I was getting worried. Okay, let's do that again. Brandy Garcia Perez, they're not here. Oh, sorry. Okay. Oscar Gabriel Vallejos, Kendra Griffin, Ren Monger, Gustavo Oguin, Jose Ortiz Batista, Lizette Robello, Jada Ruby, Cecilia Sousa, Mackenzie Van Lar. And I'm hoping the last person is the Mount Madonna student. Great. Natalie Ballin. Now we have four students. Their names are going to go on perpetual flack, plaques at their schools. And I want to I want to recognize each of them and tell you how many hours. It's really amazing. Okay. So first I'll start with Mount Madonna High School. And our, our the top hours at Mount Madonna were 124 hours during the four years of high school. Congratulations, Natalie Boleyn. Boleyn, can you come up? And just so you know, I don't think any students are there for four years. <laughs> it's typically one to two years that students are at Mount Madonna. Congratulations, Natalie. So that'll be hung at your school. All right. Yes. I'm going to do a picture with the four of you after. Actually, who's doing the pictures? Are you now? It's Bella. It's Bella. We're short. We're short. A couple people tonight. Sorry. All right. Christopher High, senior. Emily High, who completed 642 and 0.75 hours of community service. Come on up, Emily. You can stand with oh, it, right? <laughs> All right, Gilroy High School senior, Jose Ortiz Batista, who completed 606 community service hours. And Gekka senior, senior Hanya Fujita, who completed 651.9 hours. And a number of those hours were earned by organizing our volunteers for the Run for Fitness. She did an incredible job. So let's give all four of these amazing young people a hand. And we're gonna we'll, we're gonna take some pictures first. And I don't know how we're gonna organize the. Uh, I'd like all of this group to come over here, and we'll figure it out. And why don't we do pictures of them while we're waiting? So why don't all the students come down here and we'll get you organized? Yep. Yeah. Short in the front. Yeah. All in the back. You're organizing it yourself. Good job. Say that again. <laughs> there will be a chance for parents to take pictures after we're done with ours. Okay. You may have to move back. Do you want the part? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
couple board meetings, we've been recognizing our student board reps when they do their, their last uh, report. So tonight, it's my uh, pleasure to uh, recognize Jasmine Martinez, who's been, uh, you can stay there for a minute, I'm going to say a few words, and then you can come up. So Jasmine has provided valuable insights from a student's perspective to the board through monthly reports that presented information about what was going on at GECA and what was happening at our elementary and middle schools. I wanna share a little bit about her because that's what's been fun about doing these is I've been learning about our student board reps uh, through the research that Melanie's been doing. So her favorite class at GECA was Math 3 Plus and Pre-Calculus during distance learning. She liked the structure of the class, which was largely independent work 
and structured in a way that was easy to understand and complete. During distance learning, the reliable structure of this class was really comforting when everything else felt rocky and difficult. She's an incredible artist also. She designed the school's interact mascot t-shirt and a few social media posts for the Area 9 coordinator. She made a logo design for a first generation club outside of Gekka that was used for merchandise during fundraisers. And she was the yearbook cover designer for Gekka's 21-22 yearbook. After graduation, she will attend San Jose State University's animation illustration program. She, she wants to work at an animation studio like DreamWorks or Pixar. We asked Jasmine what she learned by serving as the Gekka student board rep this year. And I wanna share her answer with you. At the beginning, serving as Gekka student board rep was extremely outside of my comfort zone. Although I felt relatively okay with public speaking, I was not used to being involved in student government. Along with participating in ASB meetings, I became involved in Gekka's advisory board meetings, which were both incredibly insightful to watch and participate in. I realized that the reason was not I was not involved with many extracurriculars was because I was scared of change and meeting new people. But now I realize that being involved in school, the community, and more is incredibly rewarding. I'm determined to make more of an impact while at San Jose State University by putting myself out there more and joining clubs. I am also incredibly grateful that my principal chose me as the student board rep for this school year. Well, we are very grateful your principals chose you for to be our student board rep this year, and you've done a great job. Your unbridled enthusiasm, enthusiasm in sharing what is going on at your school with the board, with our staff members in the public has been greatly appreciated. We've looked forward to your reports, and we look forward to tonight's report, and you're an incredible representative of the class of 2022, and we're happy that you shared glimpses into your senior year with us. We wish you the best of luck as you move forward with your future pursuits. We bet, I bet we'll see your name on some Pixar film down the road. So congratulations, and we'd like to come up for a second so we can recognize you. It's a small token of our appreciation. Yes. Thank you. Right? Yes. Thank you. So you would probably need it to be. But thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. That concludes my report. And I do want to call out Isabella and Natalie for stepping in at the last minute and filling in the role that Melanie normally does. Thank you. Now we have item 3D, general public comments. And do we have any? We do not have any. Public. We have no general public comment. And we will go to item 3E, report of action taken in closed session. And we have uh, expulsion case 2022-38. Do I hear a motion? Move to expel. Ms. Michelle, second. Roll call vote. Yes. 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 Move to suspend the expulsion. I second. Roll call vote. Yes. 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 No. Michelle Nelson? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Linda Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Item four. Student board representative, Jasmine Martinez. Dr. T.J. Owens, Gilroy Early College Academy. Your last report. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. 
My name is Jasmine Martinez, as mentioned, as mentioned, and I'll be representing D Dr. T.J. Owens Gilbert Early College Academy. To begin, um, since my last presentation, March and April have been largely dominated by our, our senior project presentations. Thank you to everyone who participated in our panel. I hope that you guys enjoyed the presentations that you guys watched. And I know for mine, um, my judges were incredibly nice and they passed me. Um, I wouldn't be here tonight if I didn't, I suppose. Um, my topic was animation and I'll be majoring in that in college. So studying and researching and the mentorship for animation was incredibly insightful. And it cemented the fact that I want to pursue animation as a career. And I'm incredibly grateful to have had this opportunity through GECA to complete this presentation for you guys to watch. Next, we also had our AP testing. This was in the beginning of May. Our sophomores completed world history and juniors US history and APLAC. And then seniors took macroeconomics and government. Um, I know as seniors, this was our first year um, taking AP testing in person, which was definitely more comforting, just being in a room with other students who are also struggling on the same exam. Uh, this is way better than you know being home alone and just being like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. But it was incredibly nice, and you know, I like taking that nap afterwards when I completed everything, and it was really nice. Also, just like to go out and have lunch and talk with my friends and be like, yeah, I don't know, I don't know anymore. <laughs> And then we also had our prom. Uh, as mentioned in my last presentation, uh, a lot of students also didn't know that we were going to have a prom or even like a Disney grad night. So, so to have our prom was really nice. And I was glad to have this experience since I know that class of 2020 and class of 2021 did not get to have this. So I'm incredibly grateful also to our staff to pull this together last minute. And then uh, I think it was really funny that it was at Mama Mia's. I feel like that was so on brand for. Gekka, and it was really nice to see the other people dining while we were also at prom. And I kind of uh, wanted to join them. Yeah. But <laughs> but afterwards, me and my friends, we went to go to karaoke in San Jose. And so we wore our voices out even more than we did at prom. And the picture there is all of our friends. Also, Alyssa Gonzalez, who was recognized for community service, is in that picture. And then uh, we also had our WASC report um, that we were working on throughout the school year, I suppose. Um, this was a subject of our GECA advisory board meeting today. And I'm incredibly glad that we have gone through this. And I know that many of, um, there are many activities that allowed for students to provide their insight on their academic journey at GECA and what they have learned and what they want to see GECA improve upon in the future. We also had our career day. Thank you to everyone also for participating in our career day. I have seen, I see so many familiar faces that I saw at career day. As uh, far especially art and digital media, I actually met a GECA alumni who also is go attended San Jose State University as an, an animation illustration major. So getting her contact info was really like relieving. You know, knowing that she also went to GECA and it's all went to San Jose State University was really validating to see and knowing that my career is not out there or outlandish as I thought, and that it's possible to make it as like a 3D designer, game designer, and all that. We also had Ms. Khan's ice cream lab. This might seem a little insignificant, but if you attended GECA, you know that Ms. Khan's ice cream lab is like one of the most formative experiences of your sophomore year. But unfortunately, because of the pandemic, seniors and juniors didn't get to experience this. So, Thank you to Ms. Khan. We were able to participate with her sophomores and create ice cream in the bags. Uh, don't underestimate how much work you have to put in to make ice cream. Once I took my ice cream out of the bag, it like immediately melted because I did not pound hard enough. But it was still really fun to do and to eat the ice cream was incredibly rewarding. It was very sugary, very good, very nice. And then future events, very near future events. We have Disneyland's grad night, which is tomorrow. I will be waking up at four in the morning to get to school at 5.30 to head to Disneyland right in the bright, bright morning. <laughs> but hopefully it'll be nice. Hopefully I get onto more than three rides. And I think just the experience at like late night with all the seniors is something that I'm incredibly grateful for again, because it's something that the past 
two classes didn't get to experience as well. And then we also have graduation. This time next week, I will have already graduated. That is so crazy to say. And I can't, I can't even believe it. Like a week goes by so fast. So imagine, you know, a week from now, I'm like, I just did my presentation. And so, you know, graduation is very hard to see just because you have all these classmates that you've been with since like kindergarten or eighth grade or even your freshman year. And it's just very hard to let them go. People who've just been a part of your academic journey for so long. And I know that some, I have some friends and going to Hawaii or going to Oregon or going to, you know, just LA, it's just so far away. And it's so crazy that I will also be going on my own journey as well. To now move on, we have Elliot Elementary and we go on with Spirit Days. So they have their crazy sock day and their Western day and their floral day. I know I always enjoyed the spirit day, just dressing up with your friends. And then I assume, um, you know, just trading around your little goodies. I'm sure they like trade a little flower necklaces and flower bracelets and all of that. I love spirit days. They're so cute because everyone just dresses up and it's just like reuniting with your kid's self. Then we also had the kindness challenge. This happened in January, kind of a similar time that like Kekka had a uh, weakness of kindness week of kindness and um, they created little challenges and for their peers and they got to show their kindness which I think is very beautiful that everyone can share these beautiful feelings with each other during hard times. Then we also had the character pillar awards students who received who received this reward um, th this award got to sit with their principal and enjoy some jersey mics and students who completed their AR points also got to have principal with their, also had, get to have lunch with their principal and a goodie bag. Then there was Read Across America Day. A, uh, Santa Clara Supreme Court, Superior Court judges, uh, they got to read to their students, to the students and to every class. And then they proceeded to donate the books to the students as well, which was a definite plus. Then there was a visit from the SRO, uh, Andrew Lopez, fun fact, he actually was on our career day panel for law enforcement. So hearing his perspective on like how he got his job and his experience and everything that he has gone through, I think it lends a different perspective, you know, watching him interact with children and knowing that like he's truly the man for the job and that he's very passionate about what he does. And there was the parent club held spring event where students could bring their family and club community members got to enjoy spring and you know the Easter bunny and share little goodies and have fun with each other. Then first graders performed their Patterns in the Sky musical where they, I'm sure these students practiced for weeks upon months for this musical. And so hopefully they nailed it and they got every note. Then there was Teachers and Staff Appreciation Week. Um, teachers received um, a lunch from their students and little goodies and everything else. And I hope that the teachers and staff truly um, appreciated this week because we appreciate them. Then there was CASP, te CASP testing. Uh, CASP testing was not the most interesting thing to do. And receiving a t-shirt is definitely a plus and kind of motivates you a little bit more. Then there was the student store project for third graders. They got to use their garlic books and trade and buy items from their peers. This kind of reminds me of like the garlic festival where we all come together and trade around and look at little goodies that they made and appreciate the community. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. I hope that you treat the next board representative with as much care that you guys treated me. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Well done. And we have item five. Poor Dr. Flores always has to follow I know. up. <laughs> After follow that report. <laughs> Superintendent's report. Anyway, great job. Wonderful report. Um, well, before I start my regular superintendent's report, I have an announcement, a couple of announcements to make. Tonight in closed session, I recommended to the board and they approved unanimously 
to administrative appointments. So the first is our new principal of Brownell Middle School, Mike Nabestic. Mike, would you stand up? to tell you a little bit about Mike's uh, background in education. This is, no, you can keep standing. <laughs> Sorry, Mike, you can give him the flowers, but I'm gonna talk about him. Um, Mike's had a long uh, career in education. He's, and he started in 1989 at, here at Los Animas School and Rod Kelly as a math and computer intercession teacher, then taught second, fourth and fifth. He then became the El Roble literacy facilitator for four years and then principal of El Roble. And we missed each other as I was coming in the door. And uh, about this time in 2007, he was leaving us. And he went to um, San, San Jose Unified where he was for six years as their assessment director. And then he came back and he joined the Brownells uh, staff as a sixth grade te English teacher. I remember one year where you were doing self-contained classes, teaching everything all year. That was quite an experience. And then um, he became an assistant principal. This year uh, in October, we, we asked him to take on the interim role of principal. And he's been in that role since. And as of July 1st, he'll be principal of Brownell Middle School. Congratulations, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, and I have a second announcement to make. Obviously, Mike's not going back to his assistant principal position. So I'm very pleased to announce that uh, Didi Camarina, Camarina is going to be the new assistant principal at Brownell. Stand up, Didi. So like Mike, when Mike moved over to the interim principal position, we needed someone to fill his position. And thanks to the Ed Services Department and, and Mr. Win Dr. Winslow, um, they recommended uh, approaching Dee Dee. And fortunately she said yes. And she's been the interim assistant principal, uh, both of them since late October. And they have done a great job. They've just been such a strong team. Um, they have, each of them have strengths that complement the other and they've just done a great job. And, we got a letter from the whole staff uh, supporting making them the principal and assistant principal. So let me tell you a little bit about Dee Dee. She hasn't been in our career as many years. I mean, our district has many years as Mike, but she has a very strong background in teaching. She taught, was an elementary bilingual teacher in Santa Ana Unified, an elementary teacher in Los, Anis, Los Angeles Unified. I got to slow down. A K-12 teacher and English uh, Learner District Tosa in Temecula. Then she came here and was our Tosa for a couple of years. Then she went to the county office where she was a coordinator of ELD, dual and world languages, and then came back to the district. And we were thrilled when she came back. I know everybody feels the same way I do. She has, she has a specialty in certain areas that are just a great strengths for Brownell. So we are really pleased um, that both, they'll be in the interim, interim role, of course, till the end of this school year, starting July 1, our new principal and assistant principal, Brownell. Congratulations. And thank you for coming. You don't have to stay, but you're welcome to stay if you want. Not, oh, I didn't do my report. <laughs> I haven't done my report. Okay. I did shorten it earlier, knowing that we have uh, a meeting that may go to 11 o'clock tonight. I cut out quite a bit out of it. <laughs> you don't want to say. <laughs> Maybe you can get back to the choir, <laughs> choir performance. All right. So I'm just going to talk about a few very special events that happened in the last couple weeks. On May 6th, um, I hope I have this right, Mark, Linda, Enrique, James, and I uh, went to the Latino Family Fund tequila tasting event. There's a picture of us. This is a major fundraiser. Most of the funds raised go to scholarships uh, for our high school students. And it was very successful. It was at Fortino Winery. I think there were 300 plus people there. So I'm sure they raised a lot of money for our kids. Uh, on May 12th, Linda and I attended the Mount Madonna High School Senior Awards. A night, as always, every event at Mount Madonna is so special. 
And I know we were fighting back tears at certain points. It's just so great uh, to see our Mount Madonna students also receive a uh, some big scholarships, by the way. The UVIS Anonymous a donor gave some scholarships for Mount Madonna seniors. It was very cool. $20,000 each. Each, yes, pretty amazing. Um, I was able to participate for the first time. I don't know why it's taken so long, but I was uh, in the GECA career day and um, Ms. Flores asked me to be in the business panel, which at first I thought was a little weird, but I did it seven times. By the seventh, I nailed it. <laughs> but um, seriously, on the first one, I was able to help the students uh, understand, actually we're a slide ahead, but I was able to help the students understand that being the largest employer with the largest budget in Gilroy, we are a big business. And I talked them through all our departments and all the things that we do, just like any other business. And it began to, as the day went on, we were all sounding very similar. So we had Ken Christopher talking about the Christopher Ranch. We had two bankers talking about banks and me talking about the district. And it worked really well. And Sonia forwarded some comments earlier this afternoon. I was really touched by the positive comments. And I know that Linda also participated on which panel? I participated on the HR panel. Oh, perfect. Too bad you. you weren't there, Dr. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it was a very successful event and a lot of participation. Was it about 25 presenters or in that range? That was really cool. Last Monday, this Monday night, four to three, four nights ago on Monday night, we had our retirement dinner in person again, which was just wonderful. It was a packed room. We had actually 130 people show up. I think we had a little over 100 signed up, but 130 showed up and um, well attended by board members, Linda, Michelle, Enrique Twin. Is that it? I think. And I want to thank again Sodexo and our foods, Gilroy, High, uh, Gilroy Unified Food Service staff who prepared a meal that would be a great meal at any restaurant. It was a really good meal. We had, uh, I think, 13 or 14 retirees there. And the person on the screen is Leticia Chapa, who um, has worked for our district 44 years. So she received the Kim Felice Memorial Award. And that's a picture of her and I. Really, very cool. I don't think it's Memorial or Kim Felice is still here. <laughs> Sorry. The Kim Felice, I forgot the actual title. The word is in Kim Felice's honor and Lifetime Service Award. Sorry. There were so, memor so many Memorial Awards at the last two nights. It's just, it's on my brain. I did one myself, so it's on my brain. Kim Felice worked for our district for over 40 years herself, was an amazing employee. Um, I'm very fond of her. So when she left, we created the Kim Felice Lifetime Achievement Award, and Leticia received that award. Thank you, Linda. Um, last night, we, let's see, the next night, we went to the Gilroy High Senior Awards Ceremony. Linda James and Twin and I attended that. It was very well done. It was in the Centennial Circle. And, and Melissa. And Melissa. Sorry. <laughs> We've been to a lot of events. Sorry. <laughs> Melissa also. And uh, it, it was just so well done. And we all really liked it outside in the Centennial Circle. And they are probably going to continue that. We did it because of COVID. But it just was a much nicer event outside. And lots of students were recognized. Probably hundreds of thousands given out in scholarships. It's really amazing. The, the Christophers and the Yuva scholarship and Rudy Malone are just amazing. You know, five to 20,000, I think, is the largest. It's pretty amazing. Linda and I and Dr. Padilla were able to, before the senior awards ceremony last night at Christopher High, um, see Gecka recognized for a California Pivotal Practices Award. There were 12 schools recognized, half of them charter schools. Um, I don't know if there was another high school in the list. I don't think so. So uh, congratulations to GECA for another award. Um, and we were really happy that we were able to catch that before going to the Christopher High School Senior Awards Night. I'm afraid to say this now, Linda <laughs> James and Twin, is that right? We're there? All right, and me. 
And again, it was held outside in their, um, their quad and it was a wonderful uh, ceremony. A large class of seniors, 200 were there and many, many awards and recognitions and scholarships, again, in the hundreds of thousands. It's pretty amazing. And that I'm going to conclude because, again, we have such a long night. I do have a Friday letter hopefully going out tomorrow. Um, and I do that every two weeks. And then you can see all the upcoming events. The board and I have been out four nights this week. We could be out tomorrow night, too. There's a major art event at the one of you want to say where it is. Lynn, anybody? Sixth Street. What's the Art Center? The Art Center. On no, Monterey, 6th and Monterey, right? Or 7th and Monterey, maybe? 7th and Monterey. Our high school art classes are going to display art. So if you want to go catch that tomorrow, I think it starts around 5.30. 5? So that would be a really nice event. Studio's an art center on Christopher West 6th Street. It starts at 5.30. Great, thanks, Dr. Pia. It's Adia. next to next door from the um, Veterans Hall. Right. Oh, I was picturing somewhere else. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Anyway, as you can see on the screen, there are many wonderful events coming up before June 10th, the last day of school. Thank you. Okay, and I'm going to try to move us along because we do have uh, a long agenda. So. We have our item number six, consent agenda for the superintendent's office and human resources. This is an action item. I will entertain a motion for approval. Ms. Michelle, move approval. Second. Roll call. Melissa Harris. Yes. 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 Michelle Nelson. Yes. Yes. Linda Yes. yes. And this is our uh, meeting where we do contracts for the district. So we have a lot of consent uh, agenda items. Since so we have number seven, consent agenda for business services, uh, entertain a motion for approval. This is Melissa. I'll uh, make a motion. This is Twin, I'll second. Okay. Melissa Geary? Yes. Henry Yes. Twin, yeah. Yes. Yes. Michelle Nelson? Yes. James Yes. Yes. Thank you. Item eight, consent agenda for educational services. And I understand we have a couple, uh, we have a board member who would like to pull a couple of agenda items. Yes, I'd like to pull 8G and 8J. Okay, I will uh, entertain a motion for approval of item eight, consent agenda for educational services, minus eight G and eight J. Mark, I move approval. Thank you, Mark. I will second. Roll call. Melissa Aguirre? Yes. Henry yes. Quinn Yes. Mark Good? Yes. Michelle Nelson? Yes. 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 And consent agenda items uh, do not have discussion with them. And when we pull them, it's because we want to discuss that item. So uh, Trustee Nelson, 8G, renewal of contract between Thriving University contract and the Gilroy Unified School District, not to exceed 28,500. You have some questions. Yes, I do. And thank you for pulling this or agreeing to pull this. Um, I had a question about possibly repeating some, some programs. We adopted a program called Second Step at the beginning of the school year. And it was to address the social emotional learning, especially after being isolated for so long. Um, it's 100,000 plus another 33,000. And it was for elementary classes. And now we're uh, looking at adopting another um, another program, Thriving University, uh, for twenty eight thousand five hundred. And I'm just wondering um, what the difference is. If I can have more of an explanation about that, because it seems like we're we're doubling. 
Kathleen will respond. Good evening. Yes, I'm happy to respond. Uh, the first, second step is a curriculum. Um, I believe I sent some information to the board. Um, it was part of our expanded learning opportunities grant which the board approved. Um, a year ago, um, and it had a big component of social emotional learning, which was one of the requirements for expanded learning opportunities. And we purchased the curriculum for uh, preschool all the way through fifth grade, uh, power school, a uh, principal toolkit, all the materials that the teachers need, and they have been implementing those classroom lessons throughout the school year. We also use it in conjunction with our mental health counselors who support it in the group. We use it in conjunction with a panorama survey, which is a survey on social emotional wellness. Um, the Thriving University is one of our professional development sessions that we offer throughout the year. Last year was the first year we offered it. I did bring um, some of the feedback from the teachers I want to read to you. It says, we should have this workshop for the beginning of the year, staff development, and each trimester to help with motivation and staff motivation. This was the best way to start the morning. This is the best good positive start of the PD day. Excellent presentation. This is the best professional development I have ever attended. Very engaging, exactly what we needed. One of the best presentations I have ever heard. And it goes on and on. In all my years of professional development, I've never had this many positive uh, response. So clearly, we felt that this would be something we did want to bring back, social emotional. This particular session was for staff members, and it talked about the fact that our own wellness is really impactful on how we support our students. And so we are going to, to we are proposing, if the board approves, to do another session of that as a keynote and include secondary who did not have the opportunity to do that. Um, so in Dr. Flores and all yeah. of our certificated and classified staff staff are invited to that presentation, which is a wonderful way to start the year as, our, as some of our teachers have recommended. We're also embedding some sessions um, throughout the other professional development days. Um, one of is beyond, um, beyond surviving to thriving, um, and that will be for the elementary. And then later in um, January, we'll have something where we integrate the academics into social emotional learning. And I can say we've had many sessions on social emotional learning and we can really never have enough. It's a, a tremendous need for our students, but it's for ourselves as well. Um, and, and the impact of teachers or staff members, any of our staff members on students and those positive interactions, the things that they can do um, are so important. Uh, one of the reasons we like these this group um, and that they um, spoke to us um, was that they had a lot of credibility. They were former teachers, um, admin school administrators, and now they work with many, many districts, and they provided all their resources free. So incredible resources that teachers could implement the next day, just about interacting as they greet children in the room, different ways that they can, um, they can impact students' lives. So People left feeling very uplifted, and that's exactly the mood that we would like to create um, for our staff members and our students. So I want to make sure everybody understands the first curriculum that you're talking about, the SEL curriculum, is for the students. It's a program for the teachers, of course, to teach the students, and I've seen it many times this year, heard positive comments all year from teachers, and we're in the beginning stages of implementing that. This is for staff. And I was able to attend one of the hour long sessions with one of the presenters. And I didn't know what the thinking was at all coming from the ed services to staff department. And I was so impressed with the presenter. It was one of the best workshops I've attended all year. So much so when they proposed that we do this uh, with administrators, I said, right on, let's do it. So this, this contract that's on the agenda tonight is for training staff. That's the big distinction. Okay. Well, thank you. I I did attend one of the sessions, mm -hmm. and and I was also impressed. I was just wondering if there was a duplication, but it sounds like it's a completely different approach here. So it's a shot in the arm for staff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. It's a good question, and it gave us the opportunity to explain it to everybody else. So thank you. And I would agree with uh, Miss Beerman. Even if it were double dipping, that's fine because we can never. Uh, do enough, I think, at this point, especially now. Mm -hmm. And you had questions on H, I'm sorry, 8J.
professional services agreement between all secondary sites and education and service department with OLAS equity strategist to provide professional development in the 22-23 school year. Okay. Well, this is another, I think this is doubling up, so I don't know if I'm approaching this in the wrong manner, but um, looking at the OLAS and it's about equity and could, could I pull up that slide, the equity slide? Yeah, so, you know, this is a very famous picture that everybody, well, most people have seen, so equality versus equity, and so some people need a little bit more help in order to give them equal access or the same access that everybody else has. So I'm just wondering um, how much equity training are we supposed to be doing? I mean, because um, we had... Until a, we have equity. Well, good luck with that. Exactly. <laughs> okay, but... Exactly. But I'm wanting, you know, but we're doing it a broad brush and I'm just wondering um because in 2018-19 we we bought or the board at that time bought circle up uh was eighteen thousand dollars something like that and then uh we did it again uh June and 2021 uh sixty six thousand dollars for for circle up uh this one we uh we bought it in February for sixty one thousand dollars for forty nine people looks as if 28 people participated. I'm wondering if that was a matter of, uh, was, is that correct? 28 no, we, people? We had some more than that. So it was over several sessions. So there were people, there were 28 that attended all sessions, but then there were others that um, participated in one or more sessions. So I don't have the exact number in front of me um, of how many were there, but there were 28 that completed all of the sessions. Okay. Maybe uh, Dr. Padilla could talk about OLAS, but you know, I I feel the same way about this as we do about the social mo emotional learning curriculum and training for staff that we just can't do enough in this area. That we continue to see issues of equity in our district, whether it's in, among students or staff, and it's an ongoing area of focus for our district. And I believe it's tied to our funding sources. So. That's an added reason for doing it, but that's not the reason we're doing this. Go ahead, Dr. Padilla. And I actually really appreciate you putting up the slide because just like for our students, we don't want things equal. We want things equitable. The true is, same thing is true for our staff. And that's really the difference between Circle Up and OLAS is that there is a completely different focus because our staff, like our students, have different needs and we need to meet them where they are. So Circle Up, the reason why we asked for their services is that they are experts in bringing some teams together and talking about particular issues that we're having. We brought them to our campus because we were having issues with race and they came to certain campuses because of the issues and the language that was being used by students and to help staff understand how to address those issues directly with the students. Also on how to teach certain controversial issues that they have at that time. OLAS, the focus is completely different. OLAS is um, looking at leadership and how you lead with equity, how you infuse equity in every aspect of what you do. So our district is working on the multi-tiered system of support, and in each tier, there is a different purpose, and again, looking at it with an equity lens. So in order to really move our staff forward and to move that forward, we need leaders that have a deep understanding of equity and how to infuse that in what they do and in their schools. So the purpose of the contract for OLAS is to do just that. We have a leadership group that will be meeting on a regular basis as part of this contract. And then there's individual coaching at the sites to help the, the leaders, our administrators and their leadership team with their plans and how they make sure that in all of their plan, they are focusing on equity. So that is really the purpose. There is the additional cost because Solarsano has requested specific training that their leadership team has requested. So that is in addition to the general um, district contract. And that is the purpose. That's really the difference between the two groups and the reason for both. Any other questions? Uh, Trustee Pia? I just wanted to make a comment that, you know, I think that this is uh, something that the district should invest in. 
and we will probably be investing in this for many, many years or decades. So um, <laughs> I have no issue with that, but I did want to point out that the th there's a third slide where you remove the fence and that's justice. I know I left that one off. <laughs> and to put things in perspective, um, Trustee Nelson, I wrote down the four um, items over four years, 18,000, 66,000, 61, 165, comes to 310,000. And over those four years, Gilroy Unified's budget is close to 540 million. So 310,000 of 540 million, I don't have a problem with that. And equity is, as Trustee Fiox says, is always going to be an issue. And I think um, we are, it is our responsibility to um, work towards that as much as we can and do what we can for our students. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you for bringing that up. Gave everybody a chance to discuss it. So I will um, look for a motion to approve items 8G and J. Good, this is Michelle, move approval. I second. Roll call vote. Yes. 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 Michelle Nelson? Yes. 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 We'll move on to item nine, consent agenda for student services. Um, Trustee Good, specifically, I'm looking to you. Uh, is there anything you would like to, any items you would like to remove or set aside for, for consent agenda nine? No, I, I have some questions and that only answers going good at this point. Okay. Uh, Ms. Nelson had one. Yeah. And Trustee Nelson. Yeah, me again. Sorry. I was uh, requesting that we pull 9C for discussion. Excuse me. I'm sorry. 9C. 9C. Renewal of service agreement. Okay, so I will entertain a motion for approval of consent agenda items 9A through I uh, minus 9C. Can I um, ask Mr. Good if he would like to, um, what's the word, be recruit, abstain. abstain from A? It's the Sonia Biggs Educational Services Agreement. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so, so well, let's do B and through B and D. Okay, so that would be items B. I tried to give you that chance, <laughs> Trustee Good. <laughs> I threw out that hook and you didn't take it. So items 9B through I, H, I, minus item 9C. So we're pulling out items 9A and 9C. Do I have a motion? So moved. This is Melissa, I'll second. Roll call vote. Melissa Gary? Yes. 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 If that wasn't convoluted enough. Okay, now. Move for approval of item 9A. Move, okay, do I have a second? I second. Roll call vote. Yes. 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 Michelle Nelson. Yes. 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 And now we will discuss item nine C renewal of service. Can't even talk. Service agreement with International Institute Restorative Practices for 22-23 school year. Okay, first the, the technical thing. Could I pull up the, the slide with the two things? Uh, I had sent a question about um, Exhibit A. Um, it's hard to communicate via sometimes via email. So I can just have that picture. Who's pulling it? It's all do Jeopardy. Oh. Huh? Okay, so my question. Um, so the um, the original exhibit A was for 40,000. 40, 
I remember I'd asked at the time when we approved this, um, you know, back in the winter, um, you know, there were 80, 80 quantity. Remember I asked that question, 80? What was the question? Remember, well, mem it, remember just refer 80. back, I, I had asked about, you know, this 80 um, quantity for the, the materials. And then, you know, it was, you know, that there were enough for people to share. Well, I have my three books, by the way, so they're pretty good. Um, but the second proposal, the one that, that's attached tonight, is also dated 21022, but it's not the same. Um, it's it's been revised, so that's what I was asking. Should it have been revised? Because it's only good for 90 days and it has more stuff on it. And it changed the 80 to 90. So that's what I was talking about. It's revised. Okay, so uh, let me clarify. Okay. Um, so it is it is confusing and, and sorry about that's that. That's why I wore the shirt tonight. So, so yes, so what happened with this is that basically we requested two different proposals at the time because we wanted a spring training. So we have the proposal that the board did approve for the 40,000. That's the $40,602 um, that you'll see. That was approved already in March. Um, so that's what we're currently working under. The other one, yes, it's confusing because it's the same proposal date that they, they wrote it up at the same time, but this is the proposal that they've given us for next year. Okay. So that is the 65,861 um, that you see. That's that proposal. So we wanted to make sure that you saw what we had paid already and what we are requesting for the new contract, which is that new proposal. It is confusing because of the same date. I'm sorry uh, about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm just a stickler for details like that, mm -hmm. you know, because it does say February 10th and it says it's only valid for 90 days and, you know, okay. it's, it's uh, correct. And the company has extended that. Okay. So, yes, so um, you're okay with that. I, I do have, and I've expressed this before, a concern about the, the lack of um, uh, people signing up for it. Um, are all administrators going to participate in June? So all of our secondary administrators will be trained by August. So I have to clarify that there is more than our trainings that we're paying for that are going on. We are currently working in a consortium with Morgan Hill, as well as South Valley Youth Task Force. So we have had our training in April, where we had some of our staff and where we have had people from that consortium. We have also sent our teachers to Morgan Hill who has also had the same training on different days where we have had other staff trained and same with South County Youth Task Force. We're working together because IRP is the best in this area and also so that we can hit more people across all of our groups and organizations. So to date, we have 69 staff members who were trained in IARP. We have five now within the district who are trained to be trainers. So we are doing that on purpose. And that's part of this contract is to have another trainer of trainers so that we have the capacity within the district. It is more expensive, but then those people are then trained to be able to give the other training. For example, they trained 67 power school staff over the April break. So we did not have to bring IARP in for that entire training. So that is the goal to build our capacity within our district so that we can continue the trainings long term. So we do not have dates yet set for the new trainings because that does have to wait until the contract is approved. Right now, the tentative dates that we have are the um, last week of July for the four days. Um, for not only our administrators, we also have teacher leaders um, that are interested in attending. And then we are looking for some fall dates, but we're also working with our bigger consortium so that we have a variety of dates to choose from. It basically changes. So, and part of that is the sub issue. So instead of only having four days where everyone has to attend, that then opens it up to 12 different days where we can send people. So you don't always see, based on just our signups, how many people are actually going with what we're doing. Okay. Um, somebody is has stepped up to the plate to take Jonathan's place as a trainer of trainers? Yeah, we, yes, we have. Actually, we have a list of people, and they keep coming in of people interested in being a trainer. Yes. Okay. I'm curious about why elementary 
is not included in the list of people who are supposed to be trained because originally um, I believe um, they were supposed to have been on the list by August. So they are starting and we do have some elementary people who are asking to be trained in part of those trainings in both June and if we had that um, July training with the approval of the contract um, to have them there. However, we are working on their rollout plan that will be all of next year. So that is the goal. Right now, the focus is to get all of the secondary trained and ready to go. And because we have a rollout plan with that for MTSS and the elementary school is working on that plan currently. So yes, we will be coming back again, um, most likely next year with another contract agreement. However, for less days, because the goal is, is that by then we will have enough trainers within the district to be able to lead those ourselves. Okay. I do want to say that I, I enjoyed it. I was there with mm -hmm. Mandy um, and attended all four days. Mm -hmm. So it was valuable, but I, I would like to see it start earlier, but I think the need is there right now for secondary. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's it. Hey, I'll entertain a motion to, for approval of item nine C. This Michelle move approval. A second. Roll call vote. Yes. 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 On to item 10 public hearing. 10A public hearing on the local control accountability plan, fondly known as LCAP. This is an information item. Good it evening. is a public hearing. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, President Piceno, members of the board, and Dr. Flores. Uh, we are here this evening to present the draft local control accountability plan for 2022-23. And uh, just a few reminders, this is a three-year plan, and each year that has some components to the plan, including an annual update where we reflect upon how we did that current year. It has goals, actions, and services, and expenditures that are aligned with both the state and local pri priorities. And one of the requirements of the plan is to show how the actions that we have developed um, serve to increase or improve services for high-need students. And those high-need students are our targeted student groups, such as foster youth, McKinney-Vento, low-income students, or English learners. Because we're in um, year two of our three-year plan, you won't see vast uh, differences because we're doing continued actions from those we developed last school year. So this is a graphic that shows um, the funding through the local control funding formula, formula, LCFF, and everyone starts with the base, and you can see the base there for our district. That adjusted base is around 97 million and a little bit higher. And then the layers on top of that are related to those targeted student groups, which are known as that unduplicated pupil count, those groups that I just mentioned. On top of that supplemental funds, um, we also receive concentration. That's because we exceed the 55%. Uh, In fact, we're at around 59%. And so our district on top of that receives additional concentration funds, which again are written into the, the plan specifically um, regarding those services. And you can see some additional funds that are added on that have to do with the home and school transportation and target instructional improvement block grant. But this is the basic structure of the LCFF. Um, one of the, we've shown this slide before, but uh, when we develop uh, the LCAP, we are required to address these eight state priorities. And on the next slide, I'm gonna show you this is how our goals, we have four main goals. These goals have remained pretty constant through the last several years with slight wording differences, but our goals by the color codes, you can see how those align with those eight state priorities. And then the LCAP is a, you know, uh, a package of several components. Um, the budget overview for parents, you're going to hear about a little later this evening when Mr. Mesa presents his budget information. Um, then there is the one-time supplement. There's the actual LCAP template, which is what you have, all of the goals and actions and services 
action tables, and finally, the instruction. So you already have seen the supplement to the annual update for the 2021 Local Control Accountability Plan. That's a big, long title, but you saw that in February, um, and that was our mid-year report. And I am, um, just as a reminder, we have always in our district given a mid-year report for LCAP, which I think is good practice for you to know where we are in progress. But this year, they added it as a requirement. So for us, it wasn't any um, significant difference because we already did that but they had a template for that. It is part of this year's plan, but it didn't get approved at that time because it is now contained in the entire plan. And that's what you have in, in your packet. Um, it, this particular supplement though, spoke to the monies that we received through the um, additional relief acts, right? That was the American Rescue Plan Act and the um, 2021 Budget Act, all of those relief funds that we received in order to, re to respond to the pandemic. Um, and these again shows all the components and a little bit of a description of the various components of our LCAP. And with this, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague. So the local control accounting, accountability plan really focuses on our major goals within the district. So first we're gonna talk about the reflections of how basically our successes, what have we done well, and then our identified needs. So some of our successes, as we know, is our increase in mental health services that we've been able to do, getting view boards um, at all of our schools and focusing on reading intervention. However, we still have some great identified needs. Some of the major areas, our graduation rate did decrease during the pandemic, that our overall attendance rate also decreased because of the pandemic. Um, we've had a decrease in some of our scores and unfortunately an increase in our F rate. Again, many of those things due to the pandemic. We are required to engage our educational partners. We did try something new this year um, because we were sending out a general survey to everyone and we got a lot of not applicable. So what we tried to do this year is focus the questions on those parties that actually receive the services. So questions about EL support, we sent to EL students and EL families to get their specific feedback on what is happening in the programs for their children. We did the same for our McKinney Vento students, our migrant population, as well as our special education population. Goal one, the way we think of it is that's your academics. That's your base. How are our students doing in academics? So it does read, provide high quality instruction and 21st century learning opportunities to ensure college and career readiness. And so this is where you will see these professional development plans that we're bringing to you, providing coaching and looking at effective classroom practices. It's making sure that all students have the base curriculum um, that we require as a district. So the major expenditures under this section, this goal, is professional development. We have instructional specialists at all level. We have CTE support, and then, of course, the technology needs. Gold Dr. Padilla, could you explain what CTE is for the public? Career technical education support. Thank you. Sorry. Goal two, we look at this as our equity piece. This is our tier two in our multi-tiered system of support. So it's where we want to make sure that all students that are not there and meeting those standards have the supports that they need in order to reach those same levels of mastery. So this in this goal, we focus on continued training, and we also have a strong foundation of literacy across the board. We have support classes, for example, at high school, our academic language development classes. We have smaller class sizes for our English language development in order to support our students um, to meet those standards. Uh, we also um, want to... That's I covered up. I apologize. It says create... A a sustained system of data analysis so and support. So uh, it is covering it up. <laughs> and this is focusing on our district um, professional learning communities, gathering data. So we have data that is driving um, our instruction. 
The major expenditures in this area is our English learner support. So as I mentioned, some lower class sizes, we also have specialists um, that focus specifically on strategies to help our English learners. And we also have intervention support for reading and for math. And we also have our science instructional specialists to focus on science at the high school level and middle school level. We use um, academic progress monitoring tools at the high school. We have now extensive credit recovery and now focusing on what I just presented on equity for professional development. Goal three is our school climate and culture. What the state calls it is student engagement. Again, I want to emphasize that the state's definition of engagement is attendance. But we know in order to get students there, we must engage them. They must want to be there. And um, so we really focus on the things that will help them have a safe and comfortable school environment where they want to be. So this is where our multi-tiered system of support um, for our behavior falls in all three levels, one, two, three, so that we can support them to understand what it means to be a student and to assist them when they're struggling with that. This is where our social um, emotional curriculum falls because we know that students who are mentally able to engage with their curriculum are going to succeed. Students that have issues with trauma and other aspects where they need assistance can, cannot process the academics without the support for their mental health needs. So it's focusing on that. Um, so this is also where we uh, work on leadership advocacy and pulling our community in um, to assist us with our main goals. The major expenditures are on climate and culture for this area, um, support for school climate and attendance. Um, so getting our students there. Um, this is where we fund our school link services staff and where we have put a lot of our funding for our mental health staff um, that the um, board has generously agreed to fund. Goal four are our basic services. This is making sure that we have all of our textbooks, making sure that we have all of our staff, our classified staff, our paraprofessionals, and our certificated and administrative staff, and making sure that we have equitable and well-maintained facilities. Um, this is the majority of our budget, and as Kathleen showed you on that first side, that big bulk on base funding, this is where it goes. We also utilize some of our um, funding again, to help um, improve the salary and benefits for our staff. So we do use supplemental funding to do that. Okay, so in the next section of the LCAP plan, you'll see a section called increased or improved services. And this is related to what I mentioned before in terms of the funding sources. When you receive supplemental and concentration funds, then you're required to show and give evidence about how those actions are going to contribute to increased or, or improved services for those targeted populations. So here's an example, it's an excerpt from the plan itself where we have to take each of the actions and describe how that will contribute to uh, making an impact on those students. So if you look at the little descriptor right there that's highlighted in blue, the number two, how these actions are effective in meeting the goals for these students. And we have a lot of these in goal two because goal two is our equitable support, right? So most of our actions in goal two are around the needs of our targeted students. And then the other part of the uh, LCAP plan are these series of at what they call action tables. They used to be called expenditure tables. Um, and a group of them, those over on the right, are related to this year's plan where we reflect on and we say, well, this is what we said we were going to spend the money on. Approximately how much did we spend? And if we spent less, why did we spend less? If we spent more, why do we spend more? Um, so if there are significant differences in those funding, we need to explain that. So in many cases, you'll see explanations like we weren't able to hire staff, right? Well, that's a very common thing this year. And so that might explain why uh, certain funds weren't expended, whereas in other areas, we might have gone um, higher in expenditures and, and for a reason. The ones on the left are for this coming year plan, and we show what we plan to spend. And then we have something called this contributing actions table, which is on the next slide. 
And this is related again to the increased or improved uh, services. So this is action asking whether or not these actions and the funds do contribute to increased or improved services. So the other one just described it. Now here is with the funding, the monies. And so, for example, you'll see on that $2.5, $770,000, those are the allocations we give to the schools. So because the, each the, of our schools in our district receives um, LCAP funds go under goals one, two, and three. So here's an example. That's their uh, sort of sources of funding so that they can support the needs of the students on their campuses. So that's what those funds mean. So we are at the next step. Uh, we have already engaged in an initial consultation with the uh, Santa Clara County of Office of Education. They provided us with some feedback. We have made some of those edits. You have pretty much the most recent, although we do have a few more that they uh, want us to make. They will review it again after this meeting. And today we also met with SELPA, the uh, Special Education Local Planning Area, and uh, their staff. And that's to ensure that the needs of students with IEPs are being addressed. And they had some suggestions for us, which we will um, embed and make some minor changes when we bring back the uh, version to you on June 16th. Uh, and then we usually receive uh, several months after that time the uh, confirmation from the S uh, Santa Clara County Office of Education that we're good to go and we post it on the district website. And so now we can entertain any questions. Trustees, any questions? <laughs> Trustee Fia. Um, could I make a request? West, that sure. when you come back with, uh, can you um, highlight the suggestion or the yes the new stuff that you're adding? Yes, in? we will Thank do. You. Yes. <laughs> you don't want to read the whole thing all over again. <laughs> yes, what, when the changes were. Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much for your presentation. And this hearing is completed. I was going to say adjourned. I guess you can't Close. say that. <laughs> Done. Closed. Thank you. Item 10B, public hearing, another public hearing. Proposed solar shade structures yielding estimated $3.6 million in savings to GUSD. Information item and a hearing. Mr. Mesa. Thank you, Madam President. Good evening, board. Good evening, superintendent and members of the public. Um, Kevin Flanagan, who you'll remember from our May 5th board meeting, is here with me today. May wouldn't be, would be here, but he's feeling a little bit under the weather. So um, you'll trust that the, we'll cover this public hearing item. Um, as you know, uh, May 5th, we had a presentation in which Nate walked you through uh, the possibility of um, installing six uh, shoulder straight structures at uh, various sites. I'll just name them uh, for the benefit of the public. Uh, solar, car, uh, solar shade structures at Glenview, Elliott, Rock Kelly, Luigi, El Roble, and Solorzano uh, schools. Um, the public hearing is aimed at um, making sure that the district um, publicly acknowledges the energy offset of, of these uh, solar projects at 79% offsetting the energy. And really the bottom line is to make sure that um, we, um, uh, um, according to government code, uh, use this um, exemption from bidding requirements because it saves the districts over $3.6 million by using a power purchase agreement uh, over 20 years. A summary of the uh, impact on the, really the budget side is included in the packet, as well as the public notice that we circulated on the local paper two weeks before the meeting. Uh, and it obviously includes um, the today's date, May 19th, uh, so that the public is aware that we were gonna have um, a subsequent board item um, on agenda, um, agenda number 11D to ask the board for approval of the resolution and related documents. So for this one particular item, it's just a public hearing and the notice to the public that we are using that government code section 4217.13 uh, to not bid um, the, the, the work as is allowed by law because it's gonna generate $3.6 million of savings to the district. Any questions? Trustees, any questions, comments? Okay, thank you, Mr. Mesa. Thank Public you. Public hearing is closed. Thank you, Kevin. 
10C, public disclosure of costs related to the tentative agreement between Gilroy Unified School District and the California School Employees Association. Information item. Mr. Thank, Mesa. Thank you once again, Madam President. As you're well aware, AB 1200 requires us to disclose the public, um, uh, into the public, the costs associated with entering into um, an agreement prior to the board being asked to take action. So this is one of two related items on the agenda. Dr. Winslow will ask the board to take action on the tentative agreement itself. Uh, this is disclosure of the costs associated with the uh, GUSD tentative agreement between GUSD and the California School Employees Association, a better known as CSEA. Um, the parameters of the tentative agreement are essentially the same as reached with uh, GTA, the Gilroy Teachers Association, the um, Gilroy Para Educators, um, uh, GFP. Uh, it calls for a 7.25% salary increase effective uh, July 1 of 2021, uh, an effective January 1st of 2022, uh, an increase to the medical contributions that are prorated based on FTE. That table is included in your packet. I won't go into it, but it's basically prorated by FTE, increasing the contribution uh, that the district pays for. The total fiscal impact um, for the salary portion is 1199708 for this year and the cost of the increasing the district's health benefit contribution for this year is 62,881, uh, and that'll double next year. Uh, for the, the total cost of the um, year one is 1,262,590. The public disclosure uh, was certified by uh, our superintendent and I on May 2nd. Um, the notices of, of disclosure, um, the TA itself was shared with the county office, They've reviewed it. They've included a letter of acknowledgement in your packet as well. And the multi-year uh, impact is also included in your packet. Thank you. Any questions or comments, board members? Okay. This is a public hearing and we have no pink cards, so we have no public wishing to speak. Public hearing is closed. Item 10D, another public hearing. GUSD's preliminary budget for 22-23 information item, Mr. Mesa. Thank you, Madam President. And then we apologize for the public hearings, but it's a, a compliance driven uh, process that we have to go by. So I'll be rather brief, but cover everything that's material. Uh, so I'll provide you with an overview of the May revision, which was released on May 13, Friday the 13th. And if you're superstitious, you were anticipating the shoe to drop, but you know, good news is good news so far, and uh, didn't really matter. There was Friday the 13th, um, and then we'll cover. I'll cover a preliminary preliminary budget because based upon some subsequent items on the agenda tonight, of course, total expenditures in the general fund are expected to increase by a couple of million dollars. The June budget will include those um, subsequent um, items, so higher expenditures based on assuming the CSEA TA uh, is approved by the board, subsequent items on the salary increases to management. We could not include those in the budget um, because the board hadn't acted on them, but they will be included in the June budget. Um, and some key requirements, the Prop 2 triggers um, uh, and required disclosures that uh, we'll go through. And then I just couldn't help myself by talk about risks to the California budget. So I'll include that uh, very briefly. Um, the main revision gets us closer to the goalposts, but we're not quite there yet. Remember the governor will negotiate now, actively is negotiating with the legislature on their priorities versus his benchmark, which is the main revision. We expect an on-time budget, uh, a bill that will present it to the governor by June 15th, but then he has until July 1st and quite frankly, he can sign any time after July 1st. And Nothing has done sign a bill into law a little bit after July 1st. So expect um, a July uh, bu budget, but for us, that means we'll revise our own budget uh, within 45 days after it's signed into law. That means when the governor actually signs the, the, the bill, which could be well into July. Uh, this is a snapshot, really a couple of snapshots um, of the governor as he's releasing his nearly three hour press conference. He's very fond of that. Um, but I, I try to capture four slides that really just speak to what does it mean to public education, period. 
Um, and so for the first time um, that I can remember, I think it's it, 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 in January, Prop 98 went um, surpassed the hundred million billion dollar mark. It was 102 billion, I think, at that point in January. Well, a couple of months later, four months later, really, it's now 110 billion dollars, fueled by uh, really the big three: personal income tax, as a news tax, corporate taxes, uh, really revenues at the state. Um, I'll share a, a, a personal income tax slide in subsequent uh, slides, but it's just. Phenomenal. The reserves at the state level are well over $90 billion, the reserve level. Um, this budget will use 95% of that reserve. So it's quite scary, um, being that the economy is volatile and our heavily reliance on the top 1% income earners that effectively drive and pay for 50%, about 50% of that personal income tax number. Um, the, the key slide and that I want to spend a little bit of time on is this nice, quick summary of really the key um, changes into the May provision. So the governor is really skilled at highlighting huge numbers in the budget, and it can get confusing in terms of what's new, what's not. Uh, and so this slide does a really good job about just isolating the change from the January to May revision. So all these numbers in here, the billions of dollars in here are new in addition to what he has proposed uh, in the January proposal. Big news is he took a playbook from Jerry Brown and finally um, allowed some one-time funding with really no restrictions, basically the board's um, will, if you will, on that $8 billion flexible block grant. So it's one time, but it's $8 billion uh, for the state of California. So for us, we're getting an early estimate from school services. That's about 1,500 per average daily attendance. And hold on to that number um, because you'll see what the um, anticipated average daily attendance will be for 22, 23, but it's significant. And I want to remind you at this point, this is just a proposal. It's not the enacted budget. So that is not going to be in the June budget. It will not be. We will wait until the enacted budget because that is a often an ongoing uh, um, negotiable item with the legislature. Uh, declining enrollment, that's really uh, 2.1 billion. Uh, looking at different ways to acknowledge the COVID impact on average daily attendance. Um, on top of the proposal in January, which said you can use your three-year prior average um, of average daily attendance. Then he tweaked the formula, is proposing to tweak the formula to say, look, your average daily attendance rate for this current year dropped. And he's right. It was 90% in Gilroy Unified versus 94, 95% typically what it is. So rather than just take the 3% moving average, the three-year average um, that we know was impacted, and two of those years had the whole harmless, he's saying go ahead and adjust this year using your current enrollment this year and then take your historical 95% and apply that. So, and then take the average of the three. So it's just getting better and better at acknowledging the impact of COVID, the devastating effect it had. So it's a good part of the proposal and that's why the, the cost of that uh, has increased by 2.1 billion. And that's a one-time cost because after that, that rolling average will, will work itself out. This is really good news. $2.1 billion, even though it's obviously less than the $8 billion, the $8 billion is one time. The $2.1 billion increase to the LCFF is really good news. And I was really hoping to see something like that in the base, because that will almost dollar for dollar address our local need to fund CalSTRS and CalPERS pensions. I know that he didn't call it out during the press, uh, press release, but that is not a mistake. The Department of Finance folks are very sharp. And so that $2.1 billion is almost like, like dollar for dollar. What we need effectively, once we translate it to what we're going to get in terms of a share, it's about $2 million to our $1.8 million obligation for CalSTRS and CalPERS. So that's really great because that's ongoing. And so is the ongoing obligations on the pension front. So that's really good news. The one thing that is in our budget today, and it will be, of course, in June because it's already there, is the 6.56% COLA. That is a given. We have already included that. It's factored into the numbers that you'll see today. Um, I'm going to go a little bit quicker now. Um, an adjustment to the universal meals and acknowledgement, really, that he kind of lowball that in, in January. Glad to see that that's almost double this year, an additional 600 and 12 million. The other thing I'll mention here on this slide is 
expanded learning opportunities program, we had anticipated, or at least I had anticipated, that that $4.4 billion in January was going to come down. In fact, it increased by another $403 million. So the total for expanded learning opportunities program is now $4.8 billion. And so the per student amount, if this piece is enacted into law as proposed, is going to roughly mean 2,500 per student, and it's no longer expected to be adjusted for unduplicated count. Every district effectively will get 2,500. So that's a lot. It's a lot. Um, and so that, that's good, but we'll also watch what the legislature does. Mr. And then, Mr. Mesa, can you yes. clarify that accelerating expanded day summer school is for like our power school program. That, that is the expanded learning opportunities. Right, they were all looking piece. at me. Another two thousand. No, no, no. On top the, of what you just said, yeah, this is the, for like the power school. Program. Yeah, this is exactly why I I, I like these slides because um, it's basically the augmentation to the January proposal. So in January, the whole expanded learning opportunities number was four point four. Now it's four point eight adding that 403 million that that's it thank you trustee pisano for that and superintendent Flores. the last thing is the 3 billion 3.9 almost 4 billion dollars is for school facilities that helps the governor address the issue of the gan limit you know that proposition that said you the government can only grow as long as the population adjusted for inflation etc um, it investments into infrastructure don't count against that cap of growth if you will so he's increasing what he's uh, uh, funding school facilities uh, in May by almost um, one, almost $2 billion, $1.8 million. That's the change there. Now getting to the juicy part, the GUSD number. Now remember, these will uh, the revenues won't change um, because it, we, it, we won't. We just won't do that until the enacted budget, and then we'll come back to you in August with a revised budget or a se September at the latest. The revenues, 143 million, won't change. The one thing that will change is EPA here is estimated at nine percent, roughly about 13 million or so. Um, EPA stands for Education Protection Act. Remember, that's the proposition that the voters approved several years ago to avoid a cut to education. Um, that is currently um, at 13 million. I'm just rounding numbers. Um, well, that's going to be 25, 26 million now. So we've got a better estimate for that. So the difference will be, it will be a, a distribution of the pie chart. That's going to go down to 35. That's going to go to 11 or 12. The total will still be the same. The allocation, the funding entitlement, it's the same. It's just the shift between the um, EPA balance and the, and the state aid uh, will be less. The EPA will get more. Which brings me to a reminder that the education protection is a tax on um, high income earners in California, not, you know, we pay it or we, we all pay it to some extent, but it expires in 2030. So I, I mentioned that because as the state economy is booming and we're looking like, okay, all revenues are sky high and personal income taxes at an all time high, that will come in a recession, that number becomes a shift and a burden to the state. And then a recession, state revenues plummet, and it, the EPA just compounds the problem. It, it shifts the state obligation and then accelerates it because the income earners um, don't generate, right? In a recession, there's layoffs, et cetera. So there's like tax revenues, and that alone shifts the burden to the state, which the state will then have trouble finding it. So $26 million of EPA will come in June. And remember that it was as low as $2 million several years ago. And, and that's the issue. That's where the state has excess 90 plus billion dollars at the state level, because at one point that, that uh, uh, 26 million that'll come in June as EPA revenue to us, to our single district was 2 million. And now it's 26 million. So that's where the state is seeing freed up resources, et cetera. And that's why we have to be cautious. We meaning the state has to be cautious about long-term obligations. General fund expenditures will be $2 million higher. It will be about 150 and change if all items on the agenda are approved today. And this is just a long-term uh, history of GOZ enrollment. I'll just note that over the last six years, of course, we lost, these are actuals, you know, 21, 22, and every year before then, um, their actual enrollment, uh, CBED certified enrollment. So we lost 859 students. If we were to still have those students today, about 10,600 per ADA or so, it's easily over $9.1 million. 
you know, that funds, you know, like a Rucker combined with a Glenview or, you know, the big, not your $9.1 million, in, uh, it's a huge number and it can fund a couple of schools in our district. Luckily for us, next year is projected to only decline by 29, relatively flat. That's important because our assumptions in the multi-year rely on current enrollment at 94% of average daily attendance. And so hold on to that number uh, or that thought. This is why it's important that the governor finally increased the base local control funding formula that $2.1 billion will pay for that $1.8 million that are combined costs between CalPERS and CalSTRS is $1.8 million guaranteed uh, right now. And that's uh, that's assuming uh, that just regular salaries. I'm not even counting extra time, overtime, overages, all that stuff that happens on the regular. It's just regular salaries. It's guaranteed cost, $1.8 million. So glad to see that the LCFF is finally, not directly, but it will uh, um, help us fund that obligation. So I've been talking about the ADA, average daily attendance this year. That's the number, 9,605 is our P2 ADA this year, period. Okay, so that says information only because remember, current law says you get to pick either prior year um, average daily attendance for your funding or your current year average daily attendance funding. And so, because we're only anticipated to lose 26 students next year, and our average daily attendance historically is between 94 and 95, guess what? We'll be on current year ADA next year, even if you know uh, the, the law changes, we get to benefit of both. Um, so that's what exactly what I'm doing. The only component in the May revision that's included is the 6.56% COLA. We are not including the three-year average at this point. County offices uh, recommended against that. I completely agree with that. We can come back and revise the budget. That's not a problem for us once we know those issues are enacted into law. On the expenditure side, I do want to note, of course, it includes the GTA salary increases. The board has taken action on both GTA and GFP. The board has not, as of right now, taken action on CSEA. We had the public hearing, but we have not taken action on the tentative agreement itself yet. So those two things are not included, and management confidential are not included. But, of course, they will be included should the board approve those in the June budget. Um, note here, please, uh, we do have eliminated because we had not anticipated to decline that placeholder budget cuts that's there to coincide with declining enrollment has been removed we revisit that in 24 25 because over the next couple of years we're expected to flatten out but once that cohort leaves that class the larger class then we're expected to go down to i think 9600 in, ter in terms of the next decade so we go from an enrollment level of you know 10624 this year down to 9,600 in 10 year span. So almost a thousand student drop. And something new um, that it's highlighted here is for the first time we have a proposed resolution. It's for information only tonight, but it's something that commits balances to get uh, around the compliance of this proposition to law. So this is what I'm referring to as a draft resolution included in your packet that, that commits 18 million for other purposes. Really, we're not saying we're going to spend 18 million deferred maintenance. That's not the, the the strategy here is to get under the 10% on the multi-year projection through the life of the multi-year projection so that we can stay above the reserve requirement that the board policy sets with currently it's at 7% and really just to address the deficit spending. So it doesn't say we're going to spend 18 million deferred maintenance. We're allowed to say pretty much anything in there, but we are committing x amount that x amount will change that 18 million will change with the june uh, budget it's expected to come down of course with higher uh, expenditure base so this is a requirement that's why it's in there as a draft i will be asking you to approve it in june as part of the budget process so this is the uh, multi-year projection as you can see um, right now um, assuming the board um, approves that resolution um, we're looking to stay under the the 10% the, um, cap on reserves. I'm not showing my little cursor anymore. I'm trying to get it back. Um, excuse me. Huh. 
Oh, well, um, the reserve is 9.91%. Um, trustee Good, I'm sorry, you can't see my pointer. You can't even see it here anyway. Um, but I included, there you go. The assumption is that the board will approve um, the resolution so that we can stay under that cap. And so I specifically kept the $18 million mark to stay below that. And, and that's all a compliance issue. I do want to note that even in this um, preliminary budget prior to CSCA's TA and prior to management increases, should the board approve those, we are already at 88.1%. In terms of the unrestricted fund, we're spending 88.1% of our actual operating unrestricted budget where the reserves come from on uh, salary and benefits. So obviously, the closer you get to 90 and over 90, the tighter and tighter things get. And so the more and more you have to look at your reserves should any unexpected um, surprises come our way. Um, and you'll note the deficit spending is $5 million. Uh, it'll get worse, um, right? Because the expenditures are projected to go um, higher. But obviously, the, the COLA, this is already embedded in there. Well, I'll say about the COLA in the subsequent years, they're at, I think, 3% or so. That offsets because we know inflation is way higher than 3% at this point. So I, I anticipate later uh, that the COLAs will be higher, but so is the cost of doing business. And those things will offset each other, uh, meaning cost of goods and services will be higher for us as well, utilities, et cetera. And that's the reason why we're proposing solar projects as well, to drive those costs down. And now my screen is frozen. You, this hadn't happened to me for a long time, so of course. <laughs> There, it's, it's giving me a spinny wheel. So um, I think slide number 13, I'm just going to go off of paper. Um, it's, she's, my apologies for it. I'm trying to catch up. After the NYP is risk to the budget. So real quickly here is we know inflationary pressures are, are really high. It's concerning, spooking investors really the last this last month has been terrible for the market, bordering on correction territory. That's 20% uh, correction, right? But the Federal Reserve has already uh, increased interest rates. Why I mention that is because the stock market has almost a direct correlation between state revenues in terms of personal income taxes. 70% of the revenues in the state is driven by personal income tax. Um, I'm on slide 13, guys. And so what I have done here is the bottom of that slide 13 has um, personal income tax expectation from the Department of Finance that puts the budget for the governor. And so their expectation in April was the personal income tax was gonna hit just under 14 billion. There we go, uh, 14 billion. And it came in, I believe over $24 billion. And so the, that, that that's significant, right? When your expect, oops, I think we went, Oh, there it is. That's weird. Um, that this horizontal line is the expected level at 13.63 billion, and the actual was over 24 billion. That's a huge boost to the state. So as quickly as that, that goes up, and you can see this is an old chart, but I, I put that in here for a reason. Personal income tax right now is budgeted at 137 billion, 137 billion. It's double what this chart says. It's off the chart on the eight, on the axis, right? It, you would have to double that to, to, to be able to graph that and plot it on here. The point is in a recession, these revenues drop and we're linked to the wealthiest 1% because they pay for 50, whether we like it or not, 50% of that huge $137 billion personal income tax. So as the economy goes, the one percenters go, and so unfortunately are our futures tied to them because of the way California funding works. And I just wanted to quickly revisit, not that I liked those years, but I was a CBO in those years starting in 2009. And boy, that, that taught, t teaches a lot of, of painful uh, lessons. And this is just, I know you know this, but it took eight or nine years to make up for all those cuts and sacrifices, et cetera. So um, as quickly as we can celebrate and gather the boost in revenues, it can quickly fall and we're never gonna recover as quickly as the private industry, um, but the private industry can do things that public schools can't. 
uh, that can quickly downsize and can quickly revise um, uh, their um, uh, expectations up quicker than any other uh, sector. Uh, local agency, local education is this light gray area. And you can see we lagged. We didn't recover until the quote unquote fully funded LCFF years. Um, so it took us eight, nine years to recover. So uh, that's just something that, you know, is not lost on me. Um, this is one bill not to that we're um, looking and monitoring. I think it got a hearing today and it got put placed on the suspense file. That is not good news. But that just means I think that the governor is going to still negotiate with the legislature. Bottom line here is this bill is all about increasing the base, the base by 15 percent on top of the 6.56 percent COLA. Who knows when and if and when that's going to happen. But the legislature's priority is really the main driver here is they want to increase the base. And that's why we're watching that. Uh, Ms. Beerman mentioned the budget overview for parents. This is you saw that graphic from our LCFF calculator, that pie chart that really laid out nicely the structure of the LCFF. This is another way of looking at it, really highlighting the supplemental concentration funds are almost $14 million. Um, this is uh, another compliance component. All the other subsequent slides in the presentation are compliance related, have to show the public, we've got to talk about it, etc. Uh, this just shows that, you know, overall we have a difference in terms of budget to actual of over half a million dollars. That's simply because, as Ms. Virna mentioned, we're going to have issues with funding every vacancy, uh, all those services. So we will have an estimated carryover uh, in that range, and that explains the difference. Um, for those interested, they can read the narrative, but we've basically gone through all these. This is yet another compliance component of it. Every single year in the multi-year projection, I have to explain and substantiate the ending balance to come to zero. Basically, what it boils down to is we can't blow our reserves in the base year. We've been in trouble and bankrupt the next years. So these numbers are essentially um, preserving the district fiscal stability um, throughout the, the, the multi-year. So every single year gets a slide uh, that varies the number. But the bottom line is just to preserve fiscal stability. The next steps, obviously, uh, the governor will sign a budget sometime in early July. Um, the, the, the legislature will present him with a bill. It's the act of him signing the bill that becomes an acted budget, and that will be in July. So far too late for us to crank our wheels and, and uh, do, do those things, which is why the law allows for a 45-day budget revision. So that will come to you uh, likely in August, in the first or second meeting in August. Thank you, Mr. Mesa. Trustees, any questions or comments? I think we're all stunned. Um, Hopefully on as, a good note. As, <laughs> as trustees, we get um, a lot of information from multiple emails a day from CSBA and a variety of other sources. And I do not recall, I hope my fellow trustees will remember the source. Um, and an article that says uh, public education in California uh, will cannot um, maintain its um, significance or existence specifically due because of the nature of finances and how it's financed by the state of California. And I, the graph that you showed for the risk to the state budget, which is a roller coaster, which is exactly what we deal with. And right now they're saying, you know, we have lots of money and a recession is coming and we have high inflation and we have to, you know, be in the red three years out. So um, difficult times in, in uh, education. Just when we think things are going well, then we get slammed. Mm -hmm. And then we try. I remember being really angry when uh, Governor Brown increased our LCFF and everybody, everybody was so excited. And I said, you know, it's 2014. We are now back to the levels of 2008. Thank you very much for getting us to 2008 in 2014. That's yes, my you, soapbox for the evening, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have any questions or comments? Just that we wanna be in the black, not in the red. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Messam. Oh, one more thing. This is Michelle. And oops, okay. Sorry, I just I was go ahead thinking. Ah, 
So I just want to confirm. So STRS and uh, the STRS and PERS obligations are pretty much covered. That's confirmed. Should that increase to the LCFF base is still remain there in the enacted budget at $2.1 billion ongoing? That will pay for the increases that that 1.8 million guarantee mm -hmm. that we're going to have to absorb in 22-23 fiscal year. Awesome. Yes. But that's a that's a choice we make with that money, correct? Correct. That's not designated for it, CalSTRS or CalPERS. It, it is not designated. The, the good news is that, as you can yeah. see here in the chart, um, if you allow me to go back, uh, the rates are supposed to supposed to project it to. Those are assumptions, right? Don't don't call my bluff later. I'm <laughs> supposed to. Uh, uh, the assumption is that they're expected to stabilize at those rates. So that's why it's so important that the 2.1 billion ongoing is there because then it really kind of levels it so that the future colas are really then going to address the cost of doing business rather than funding this first. And then what's left is what we have to work with for funding the cost of doing business. Not just. Recall year after year after year, this became an, an an issue at the negotiating table. You know, it was always a consideration. This is coming. This is coming. This is coming. Okay, yeah. thanks. Thank you. Close the public hearing. Now we will go to. I, thank you, Mr. Mesa. Item 11A: Approved tentative agreement between the California School Employees Association (CSEA) Local 69 and Gilroy Unified School District for the 21-22 contract year. Dr. Winslow. Thank you, President Piceno, Board Trustees, Superintendent Flores. I'm very happy to be able to present to the board a request to approve a tentative agreement between CSEA or California School Employees Association. Local 69 in the Gilroy Unified School District. As we heard from our CBO earlier, this is the second part of the proposal to the school board for approval. Um, in front of you is the actual contract language, which is involved in the tentative agreement, as well as some of the stipulations for those changes as mentioned earlier about salary and benefits. I am very happy to report, and very shocked to report, I think a world record, I did talk to President Figoni, who let us know that this was not only ratified, but ratified unanimously by her membership. So very happy to awesome. be able to report that to the board as uh, that's a very good uh, vote of confidence that there's approval for this tentative agreement in front of you. Any questions or comments? I will entertain a motion. This is Michelle, move approval. Enrique, I second. Thank you. Roll call vote. Melissa Yes. 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 Michelle Nelson? Yes. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. Item 11B Establishment of Classified Management Position Coordinator After School Programs. Salary schedule for this position ranges from 80620 to 104331 and this is an action item, Dr. Winslow. Thank you, President Piceno. As you've been hearing a lot from our CBO, the expanded learning opportunity program brings not only a lot of funding to the Gilroy Unified School District, but a lot of additional work. And so as we talked to um, Amanda Reedy, who's our program administrator in charge of all after school programs, we are requesting that the board approve the establishment of a new classified management position called the coordinator of after school programs. And so attached to this request is not only um, the proposal from the agenda, but also the actual job description that we hope to post as early as tomorrow. It's very important to note that this new position has no impact, again, no impact to the general fund. This will be um, wholly paid for from the new funds of the expanded learning program, as our CBO talked about earlier, and as the board approved earlier from a presentation by program administrator, Mandy Reedy. And so we're requesting that the board approve this so we can move forward and um, look for this position. Questions from trustees, comments? Uh, just a comment, Ms. Michelle. Um, people ask a lot, geez, another management position, but this is, this is needed. Um, one person cannot possibly coordinate all the different puzzle pieces that are happening after school. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion for approval. This Michelle move approval. This is Melissa, I'll second. Thank you. Roll call vote. Melissa Yes. 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 Yes
Yes. 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 Thank you. 11C, approval of model fixed price contract between GUSD and Sodexo America. Who's more excited, us or, or CSEA? <laughs> Um, this is <laughs> or Mandy. This is a an action item. Sorry. Thank you, Madam President. Good evening again. This is an action item. Uh, the board approved the request for proposal back uh, in February second. Um, we uh, had a mandatory bid walk as part of the process. During the mandatory bid walk, three firms showed up: Home Cooked, Chartwells, Sodexo. Um, on uh, the proposals were due, of course, and submitted. Then only two firms submitted proposals. That was Chartwells and Sodexo. A committee evaluated both proposals and applied the criteria uh, and interviewed Chartwells and Sodexo. And uh, in your packet, uh, you have the you know the comp composition of the committee members, et cetera. Um, I would like to thank both Chartwells and Sodexo for putting really thoughtful uh, proposals and for uh, coming to our um, inter in interviews. Uh, both firms did fantastic. Um, however, um, based on the criteria, we are recommending that the board award the contract to Sodexo. Um, the fee of 3,674,315 will be funded by the Child Nutrition Fund. Uh, this fee is inclusive of food cost, staff, equipment, point of sale, uh, upgrades, et cetera. Uh, and it is based on approximately 2.4 million meals, breakfast, snacks, uh, et cetera, uh, included in the proposal. The model fixed price contract uh, will be shared with CDE, the California Department of Ed, um, as soon as the board approves it, probably tonight or tomorrow morning. Um, and uh, the sign-in of the RFP, all related documents are included in your packet, should you have any questions. Trustees, any questions or comments? Okay, I'll entertain a motion for approval. Uh, this is when I so moved. I will second. Okay, roll call vote. Yes. 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 And we have Motion carries. We Thank have uh, 11D, new contract approval of resolution number 21-slash 22-22. <laughs> power purchase agreement with Forefront Power and determining other matters in connection with an energy conservation project at Glenview, Solarzano, Elliott, Rod Kelly, Luigi, and El Roble. Action item. Thank you, Madam President. Once again, uh, the attached resolution 21-22-22 needs board approval, along with the general conditions and energy services agreement for each of the six schools. Uh, this is related to the public hearing item we had earlier on the agenda. The district will be charged approximately 21 cents per kilowatt hour of the energy produced for the solar arrays for 20 years for a combined savings of $3.6 million to the general fund. Uh, board approval is requested of this resolution, making the findings on energy savings and determining other matters in connection with the energy service agreements. Any questions from trustees, comments? Hearing none, I will entertain a motion of approval. This is James, I move to approve. This is Melissa, I'll second. Roll call vote, please. Yes. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Get those bills. Thank you. 11E, public disclosure and approval of management and confidential salary increase. Action item. All right. Good evening, boys. This is the last you hear from me, right? <laughs> so, this is a public disclosure, I mean, public disclosure and approval. So because management confidential employees are not in a bargaining unit, uh, we're not required to do this. However, we have always done that um, and filled out the same disclosure documents 
Dr. Flores and I certify it just like if it was a bargaining unit agreement. However, of course, management is not a bargaining unit. It's done for the purposes of transparency. So uh, the, uh, the proposed increase to um, uh, management and confidential employees um, are also, um, uh, it's for the same 7.25% as reached with other uh, employees of the district. 7.25% uh, increase retroactive to July 1st. The uh, if effective January 1st in 2022, uh, similar to the increases in CSEA, uh, the district's medical contributions are also increased. The little table there shows the contributions of 8,834 single, two party 6,203, and family $21,064. The 7.25 salary increase and additional contributions to health and welfare benefits will be provided to all management, all confidential employees. This action also applies to certificated management, classified management, confidential superintendent, and two assistant superintendents. So we wanna be real clear about that. And then beginning in 22-23, so next fiscal year, the longevity, I won't go into all those details, but it's included in the board briefing for confidential employees has also been um, updated. The total cost of the 7.25% salary increase will be 714,299 this year. Um, the increases to the district share of benefit contributions will be 74,878 this year, and will increase to 149,756 for next year. Um, the same uh, um, statement that all 7.25% salary increase and additional contributions to the health benefits will apply to all management confidential employees, including certificated management, classified uh, management, confidential superintendent, and two assistant superintendents. Questions or comments from trustees? This is Michelle. I'd like to make a comment. Sure. When I ran for the, the board, I was interviewed by uh, the CSEA executive board, and it was televised. And I was asked the question about the Me Too. And I promised at that time that if it came up for management, I would vote no. But since then, I hate to do this. Um, I, I have received some information about you know comparables, comparable data, which I'm not at liberty to share. But um, some people are below uh, the midway point. Some people are over. But it is difficult at this time and it takes a lot of staff work and actually um, work from other agencies to find the information that we need to find, dig down and get comparables for every single position. But what I have seen is the work, you know, they're comparable. So I'm going to vote yes for the Me Too. Um, I'm also afraid that we could lose some people in management who we cannot afford to lose. Uh, because of their expertise and the pool is shallow. I also want to recognize the hard work that management has done this year and the previous year. Everybody has worked their tails off uh, during COVID. I also want to recognize management in the district for their willingness to increase the salaries. It, it took a while, but we got there for all the bargaining units and the flexibility to think out of the box to improve the, the CSEA and GFP salary schedules. It was time to to fix those, and thank you, Dr. Winslow, for your uh, your willingness, you know, to to fix that and your creativity in fixing that. So, even though I did promise, because it doesn't make it doesn't mathematically it doesn't make sense. If you have a seven point two five on a fifty thousand dollar a year salary you're gonna get $3,625 extra. If you make 200,000, you can make $14,500. So if you're a CSA person, I mean, I just had a plumbing issue in the house and it cost me over $600. So if I had been a CSA person, you know, that would have hit me hard. But if I had been, you know, of course, I never make 200,000 in my life, but um, if I were to make four times that, then it would, wouldn't have affected me that much. So I do need to recognize that it's it's not the same. It's not apples to apples. But uh, at this time, I'm going to go along with, with the Me Too and continue to push for something that makes a little bit more sense down the road. Thank you. 
Trustee Nelson Wales, always have to um, look at new information and apply it to today in our situation now. And sometimes that means we change our outlook on things. So kudos to you for taking in new information. And a former science teacher. <laughs> When's a science teacher or is a science teacher? Any other trustees? Comments? Okay, I will entertain a motion. I'll make the motion to approve. I second. Thank you. Roll call vote. Melissa Gary? Yes. 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 Michelle Nelson? Yes. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. I, On behalf of management, thank you. Thank you. 11F, monthly district cash flow update. Kimberly Smith, Director of Fiscal Services. Good evening. Good evening. President Seno and Superintendent Flores and board members. So I'm going to bring you up to date on the monthly cash flow. And I just wanna say we look really good. <laughs> I'm done. So, <laughs> so it's good news. So um, the, the cash flow spreadsheet is based upon the July through April actuals, and then the rest of the year, May and June are projections at this point in time. And this is still um, based off of current year. This is not um, adopted. When we bring June 16th um, board approved, you'll see a new cash flow. So um, you start with April, the beginning balance, a little over 59 million is what you start with. And then the cash that we brought in for April is a little over 21.7 million. Our expenditures were a little over 15.6. And the delta there between what you brought in for cash and what you spent just during that month is a little over $6 million positive. And I wanted to point out, um, I don't know if I've ever mentioned this before, but the total prior year transactions, that $1.6 million is actually um, a combination of your prior year liabilities, PYLs, your prior year receivables, and um, what they call suspense accounts. So it's, it's all the behind the scenes accounts like um, when payroll comes and goes throughout the books. So that's a combination. And then you clear it as you go. In other words, at the end of October, we usually clear all of our PYLs or prior year liabilities, which are payments that we're paying in this year, but belong to last year. And then you'll see the ending cash balance there almost $67 million. Down at the bottom there, um, total compensation is 81% of the total expenditures up there. And that includes all of your certificated, classified, and all of your statutory and health and welfare benefits. You'll notice that April is a little bit larger there as far as the certificated payroll. And that's due to the fact that we were able to get our retros done for um, our certificated employees. And the next slide here is just another way of looking at your cash coming in, your cash going out, and your cash balance there. Any questions? Questions or comments, trustees? I don't think I've ever presented a cash flow with this amount of money, ever. <laughs> and I've, I've got 22 years in school finance, so. Never. I'd like to say this is going to be the norm, but we know it's yeah, not, so it, we'll just enjoy been, it now. Right. This is both restricted and unrestricted fund in, in the general fund, which um, includes all of our CARES funding at this time. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Item 11G, first reading of recommended instructional materials for high school AP advanced placement English literature, physics, AP environmental science, veterinary science, and environmental horticulture. Information item. I have to read Dr. Them Padilla. More than once. <laughs> Thank you, President Paseno, trustees, Dr. Flores. 
I'm going to um, do a brief review. You have a lot of information in your packets. So I'm gonna go over a brief e review of what you have. So first of all, you have five books um, in front of you. And if Ms. Huerta, she does have them at her desk. If Ms. Huerta would not mind passing those right books there. around, um, you can see samples of each of the books that we are looking at adopting. These will also be on public display um, for the next 10 days. So for this process, Process. As a reminder to the board, in order to um, offer advanced placement courses now, we must have textbooks that are newer than 10 years old. So we must adopt books when they are reaching that 10 year limit. And um, we have two of those on this list. Um, our other books are basically within that cycle of adoption. For all of our adoptions, the process we use and what you see in your packets is that we have a facilitator Normally it is an administrator from the district um, who facilitates the process with the teachers that are actually teaching the process. It's a lengthy process and there are rubrics that they have to fill out. They also have to get feedback um, from their students um, as to the usability of the text. And um, we look at it on a multiple um, variety of levels, including with an equity lens. And so we use that for every process for our textbooks. So the first one is our AP English Literature textbook. Now, some of you who have been here for a while will say, wait a minute, this looks like the same textbook. Um, it is a newer version of the same textbook. It is still the best on the market for AP um, Literature. It is what, what is used by 90% of the AP Literature um, courses um, throughout the country. So yes, it is the updated version of the AP English Lit book by um, Perrine. So I'm not going to go through all of the reasons um, because as I stated for AP, the main reason is because it is almost 10 years old. The financial cost for this book is $35,917.23. This book is for both Christopher High School and Gilroy High School, as Mount Madonna and um, Gekka does not offer AP courses um, in English, um, because by that point, our Gekka students are at Gavlin. So the next one is our AP Environmental Science textbook. The book that they are recommending is Exploring Environmental Science for AP. Cengage is the publisher. And so again, the purpose for this is because the other book is outdated and it must be renewed to continue the course. The financial cost for that book is $22,286.75. Again, this book is for Christopher High School and Gilroy High School, as our other two high schools do not offer this course. The next one is this high school physics textbook. And um, thank you, Miss Lee, for bringing that sample textbook. Um, and Miss Lee was also on the committee and piloted this book. And um, we are recommending the Houghton Mifflin Harcourt Brace book, Physics in the Universe. So our current physics textbook is very old. We are very late on this adoption, not to any fault of anyone in the district or our teachers. It is simply because the textbooks that have been available have not been adequate for high school physics. So although we have looked every year for appropriate textbooks, this is the first time the committee, which are the teachers, felt like there were books that were appropriate to even pilot more or less adopt. Um, so we're very happy that we have finally found a physics textbook because honestly, our teachers have been using a lot of their own materials because although we've had a textbook, it was not sufficient for what we needed. So we are very happy that we have found a textbook that the teachers have agreed upon. Dr. Padilla, yes. 50 years ago when I was in high school, I was terrified and didn't take physics. If that was the textbook, I'd have gladly taken Take physics. It. <laughs> it makes sense. It's easy. It talks about math separately and how it applies. Ah, that's very good. And I compared to what it. we have, it's an, a night and day difference <laughs> um, from what we've had. 
Um, so they did for this um, book, they did pilot two different books, the HMH that you see in front of you and the Savas. And as you can see, there are many more strengths from the HMH based on, again, the extensive rubric that we use. Um, there are some limitations. There is no textbook that has ever been written that is perfect. So there are limitations, and that's where we work with our team to find the supplemental materials needed to supplement, um, to recover from those limitations. The cost for this book is $123,558.18. Um, this is for both high schools, Christopher and GHS. Um, again, at GECA, at Biophysics, they are taking that at the college. Um, so we don't offer that at GECA. It is, it is for the students, but at Gavilan. And we currently do not offer that at Mount Madonna. Dr. Padilla? Yes. Just a question. How many teachers are able to pilot these books? So it depends on, on the book um, and how many teachers we have teaching the courses. So for the AP courses, not very many, because we, normally we have two or so that are, are teaching it. Um, Ms. Lee, do you remember how many piloted for you? Four? Four teachers. Um, so we don't have all of them um, pilot. For one, it's hard to get the companies to give us that many books um, to pilot. Also, we want a committee. We try to keep our veteran staff there who knows what's happening, and we try to keep it small enough so that um, we can come to consensus. So if you have all the teachers, it makes it a little bit challenging. However, this time, I think that's pretty close to all of the teachers we have is four um, for physics right now. So almost all that are there were part of this committee. Okay. Uh, so the next book you have is our ag program, our veterinary science. Um, we have actually had several veterinary science textbooks um, that you have seen. Um, and we are asking for this new adoption um, because this, the science has changed. Um, and the technologies change in the expectations. So um, our program um, goes to competitions where they actually do veterinary science and they do recommend particular textbooks that they believe are the most recent in the field to assess, assist our students so that they can go from school to career if they so choose. So it is the um, FFA program um, that recommends this in Ag Sciences for this textbook. So we are recommending this and the cost is $7,480, um, which is basically for two sections of veterinary science, which is offered only at Gilroy High School. The next one is environmental horticulture. As you may know, um, the district and the board has funded a beautiful greenhouse at Gilray High School, and we have refurbished it. So we want a course so that we can keep it up and utilize it to its fullest potential. So we do have floriculture, which is what happens after things have grown in that greenhouse. So we want the horticulture, which is a course on our books, but we would like that course so we can actually be growing things through our own program. Um, so this is the book that would help them with that. Um, this course, again, is only offered at Gilroy High School. And the cost for this would be 5,995 for one section worth of textbooks. So the total cost for this adoption cycle would be $195,238.16. Thank you. Trustees, any questions? Trustee Fia. Uh, do any of these books have like online components or do the students have to carry these thick, heavy books <laughs> to school all the time? All of them have online components. Yes, that is actually part of the rubric that they look at um, when they're looking at all of the supplemental materials. So they have both teacher resources online as well as student resources, which includes the textbook itself. The adoptions all do include those licenses to access the textbooks online. Other questions? Comments? Yes. I guess just a clarification on is it components or equivalents? I'm sorry? Uh, I guess I just want clarification. Are they components like uh, consumables or are they equivalents of the same textbooks online or? Online. They have the full version of the textbook online as well as other resources for students um, and for teachers. Thank you. This is an information item mm -hmm. first reading. So we'll see you again next month. Thank you. 
You have to read, you have to read that whole lit book <laughs> twice. Item 12. A, <laughs> A through G. Mr. Paul Nato, facilities and maintenance. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I've got a number of items for you this evening, and it looks like we're doing great on time. So we certainly are. We'll take you right to 11 o'clock. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, don't, don't, take don't push your time, my luck. Paul. Got it. Everybody, everybody else did what I asked. So. <laughs> Assume you're running late. <laughs> got it. Okay, that's done. <laughs> Okay, we are, I'm gonna uh, briefly up, update you on South Valley Middle School, the modernization project. Um, Dr. Flores was able to come check it out uh, just a few weeks ago. We took a tour around to see the, uh, the interior of the campus. You can see the, the quad, the paws coming together quite nicely. Um, all of the buildings, in fact, you can barely see in the background that kind of Capitola townhouse look coming to life with the different colors of the school buildings. Um, as the weeks progress, you're going to actually see that all the way around. It's It's got a really, really nice look. Um, we're looking forward to that June. Uh, you should enjoy a great tour. Um, it'll be, we'll be able to go into the classrooms. You'll see kind of what a finished classroom's going to look like. Um, a lot of what the campus will look like, The a lot of the flat work will be out, so it'll be easier to walk around. Um, and it'll be probably the last time you get a glance at the old campus. Uh, we'll be demise or demolishing that campus in the weeks uh, subsequent to that. So it's a good time to not miss a tour. And unfortunately, I'm going to miss that tour. So uh, <laughs> Marissa will be there and she'll take uh, good care of you. Uh, this is the inside of uh, what you're seeing on the left is the inside or the outside of the uh, of quad A, and you get to see some of the uh, the different aspects of the buildings and the colorings. Um, they're putting in the foreground, you'll see that's where the uh, shade canopy is. Huge shade canopies are going out into the, each one of those quads. Uh, to the right, you're looking at the seventh grade science classroom. Uh, so they'll be outfitted with cabinetry on both sides of the rooms, both uppers, lowers, uh, sinks, and then that cabinetry wraps around into a prep room uh, just behind that. And moving on, um, we're going to say goodbye to an old friend. Um, this summer, we have plans to actually demolish the, uh, the old music or IT or day school or whatever many of its incarnations have been over the decades. Um, the, uh, the structural integrity is is on the what we're calling the old IT building, or as some of us in the room called it the Bat Cave at one time, um, uh, is going to come down this summer. Uh, we've got some quotes to have that taken care of. Uh, structural inte integrity of the roof in a few places is uh, is getting kind of dangerous, and we really don't want to risk uh, any transient activity in there. So we'll be taking care of that. and the Miller Clue Slough cleanup. Um, so you guys were probably made aware last month, uh, actually in March, we started this program. We had a number of issues uh, happening along Miller Slough. It had been a homeless encampment for quite a while. Um, this was in no stretch a, uh, a one-man show. Uh, Dan and his team worked on it. Arulio with the PD worked on it. The city, the Compassion Center helped to work with a bunch of folks to relocate and provide some services for the folks that were relocated from this area. Um, and then once that uh, was done, we brought in another uh, two contractors. One was Moki Smith and the other was an organization called Cheer, a very interesting group uh, that you will probably hear more about in the future. Uh, they came in and by hand cleaned out the Miller Slough um, that's all within our property line. It's an amazing amount of work. Um, you can see on the left hand side what was um, what what it was back in say about March. On the right hand side, you'll see it's cleaned up and uh, sub subsequently I've taken a, a bunch more pictures um, and it's like that our entire um, length of our property. It's all cleaned up. There's very, very minute residue, but nothing more that you would 
you'd expect to see. Um, so it's just going to take vigilance on our side to make sure that we maintain that and our good neighbors over at GPS uh, to help with that effort. Um, the PD has a dedicated team that go and check on it and actually work with the folks there. So I'm very proud of, of what we've accomplished there um, with not only GPS's assistance, but Aurelio and his team, Dan and his team and the uh, Compassion Center and Moki Smith and Cheer. So thanks to all of that. I think that's about it. Um, quick one this, this month. And Dan's obviously not with us this evening, but he'll be back in June. Um, I'll move on to item 12B, um, which is the approval of an agreement with Navigator Schools, uh, Gilroy's Prep School for the use uh, or for facilities use. So I think we reported last month that um, GPS is actually going out for uh, Prop 51 um, facilities use, and there's an apportionment for uh, charter schools specifically. So they're applying for two formats, I believe, renovation and expansion uh, at GPS. And one of the elements to that agreement is an agreement with the, uh, with the board uh, for facilities use. So essentially, this agreement is to uh, agree to develop that agreement. Um, essentially, what we uh, the goal would be is to allow Navigator to operate there as long as they're a charter in good standing and providing that they are um, taking out a loan and uh, and going for the grant to uh, to expand their campus. Um, and we do have both Kevin and Kirsten from Navigator to answer any questions if any appear. Trustees, any questions or comments? Okay. Excellent. All right. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. I will move on to item 12C. Mr. Nato? Yes. Would you like us to vote on um, 12B? <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm so used to doing them all in a bundle, but yeah. Let's yes. Just, it, yeah. Yes. If you, yes. That would be wonderful. We'll let them go home. <laughs> Move for approval. I second. Roll call vote. Yes. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you to uh, Trustee Pace, who was on the ball and suggested that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I will move on to item 12C, uh, which is the uh, approval of uh, payment of fees uh, with the DSA for the oversight of the playground installation at Luigi. The amount is $8,862.50. As you know, the DSA is our governmental oversight for installations, facilities based items. This project has a number of elements that the DSA is concerned about, but we're working through all of those items. Um, nothing to be alarmed about, but yes, that's typical for doing all of our work. Um, I can entertain any questions you have about that. Seeing none, I'll move on to item 12D, uh, approval of a contract with Padre Associates Incorporated for the soils management oversight at South Valley Middle School, not to exceed $63,900. Um, so part of the excavation or dem demolition of the existing site uh, includes removing any hazardous soils. So we've, uh, we work with both the T DTSC, the Department of Toxic Substance Control, and a contractor, in this case, we contracted with Padre um, to oversee the uh, excavation and document the excavation of any hazardous soils. On this particular campus, we had, this was a very clean campus, it was amazing. All of the sports fields came back super clean. Um, on the entire campus, we only had two spots of any kind of soils contaminant, and it was, uh, it's based on deteriorating um, uh, window caulking. Uh, on the backs of the so, uh, of the windows over the years that it just doesn't break down. And so it's, it lays dormant in the soil. Uh, so elevated amounts of that was in the soil. And so we have to pull that out. Uh, we'll take care of that over the summer and Padre will actually take care of the management, uh, air quality testing and abatement of that, uh, of that process. 
Uh, seeing no questions, I will move on to item 12E, which is the approval of a contract with EnviroScience for the industrial hygiene oversight at South Valley Middle School, uh, not to exceed $146,715.63. Uh, same thing, this is just inside the building. So we'll do, do the demolition of the site and that requires that we um, monitor air quality uh, while the con uh, construction company demolishes the old site, make sure we're not contaminating the air or any of the uh, stormwater. Um, it's, it's intensive, but we do it on anything we demolish. Um, so, and it's fairly common. Uh, we've used this company for a lot of our stuff. They're very familiar with all of our buildings. I'm sure you've probably gotten used to their name by now. Um, they're great for their schools. Um, we bid these out and these guys always come in very competitive. It's mostly because they've worked with us for so long. They don't need to do a lot of the legwork that other companies would have to do. So that's great. Uh, the same company does what we call AHERA reports and Dan presents those annually to you. Um, so seeing no questions, I'll move on. Item 12F, uh, approval of a contract with E3 Systems Incorporated to remove IT equipment at South Valley, not to exceed $6,562.41. This item and item G have not been reviewed by the facilities subcommittee. These quotes came in after the last subcommittee meeting and I was presented to them or I, I got them after the last subcommittee. So this is the first time uh, the board or the subcommittee has seen these. Um, this basically consists of migrating our IT infrastructure out of the old campus and into the new. So E3 systems will actually go into our existing campus and they'll pull out all of the existing um, IT infrastructure, switches, access points, um, any of our network gear, our routers, um, cameras, if any exists still, um, and other elements designated by IT to have pulled out. We'll then tender them over to um, Converge One, which is item 12G. Now, Converge One is a much bigger outfit. They will actually configure and install the new network into the classrooms over the summer. Um, with Maribel's help in IT, she's actually designed getting the network backbone up and running before we finish um, a lot of the structural uh, items. This is important because we're installing bell clocks, cameras, other items that hang on that network. And if the network is up and running, IT can actually stay on track and, uh, and see things as they come on online. And it eliminates a lot of issues um, with the network if they can, if they can do that. So uh, item 12G is the approval of a contract with Converge One uh, to install the IT equipment at South Valley Middle School, not to exceed $328,477. This- Paul, did you yes. get bids for this? For did, this item, did you get bids? This did not go out to bid. This is actually covered under uh, California multiple award schedule. So oh, it's not so required that. to be bid. Okay. Yeah, it's I just wanted bag. to make sure. Yeah, this one would have definitely needed it. And yeah, they went through a CMAS program. So yeah, I believe she did the same thing for Brownell. But yeah. Not with Converge One? With Converge One. And we were happy with their work there? Yes. Uh, Converge One, as I understand it, I wish Maribel could, I could phone a friend, but I do believe she was introduced to them when they were doing the network upgrades a number of years ago. I think 2016 to 2018, she was doing a lot of network infrastructure upgrades here. Um, so yeah, that's it. And I do know that we work with them at, uh, at Brownell for sure. So that, yeah, without a doubt. Um, We've I've used them in a prior life. It's a big outfit. They're very well worth it. And they do great design work, which is one of the hard parts. So trustees, any questions or comments? Okay, I will entertain a motion to approve items 12 C through G. I'll make a motion. I will. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Roll call vote. Melissa Geary? Yes. 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 Mark Yes. 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 Thank you, Mr. Nader. Thank you. Good evening. And you get out of here before 11. 
and with any luck, so will we. <laughs> Item 13, board member reports. And this is Michelle. Mm -hmm. I had fun this week. I went to Luigi Aprea and played with kindergartners for two to three hours. I worked with a kid and pronouncing T for about 10 minutes because she was having trouble with T. So I felt like a speech pathologist for T. And so I had to take off my mask to show her where her tongue should be. So anyway, they're very cute. My entire career was spent with um, secondary kids, seven through 12, but the important work really starts when they're little. You have to have that base. So I encourage anybody to go volunteer with the younger kids. I'm going back next week. I'm going to check on our tea. Any other reports, comments? Yes, twin. I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. I'm big enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in addition to the uh, awards nights, I well, last week I attended Solar Sano. They had their mental health awareness week rally. It was really great. Um, Kids, uh, the middle school kids really enjoyed the Wheel of uh, Fortune <laughs> that I got to do with them. So that was really wonderful. Um, thank you for the Solar Sun on staff for inviting me to attend. Um, I also attended the um, Youth Alliance. Uh, they had a, a, a virtual town hall um, yesterday. Uh, regarding fentanyl and so we actually had our students so we had a couple of students from Gilroy High School and um, Mount Madonna High School do the um, the virtual town hall and it was broadcast statewide wow. and they had over 100 registrants so it was a virtual and uh, in person so it was really really impressive anybody else trustee please uh Speaking of awards nights, I, I think it's important that the generosity of this community is awe-inspiring. Um, there was a life-changing amount of money given out to, to students who needed it, and it's wonderful. I um, just want to report on, in addition to the um, senior awards, first of all, this time of year, you know, you always hear in the community and in the media um, that our and every generation does this, that these teenagers, are, you know, our, our future is dim. These teenagers are, are lazy and they don't want to work and they don't want to whatever. Um, all you have to do is go to any award ceremony, any graduation or promotion ceremony and realize that our future is indeed bright. We have some incredible, incredible youngsters coming through and that will be leading our communities, our states and our country. Um, I, uh, Mr. Messa, you'd be very proud of me. I watched the CSBA webinar on the May revise, did not fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I always like to do that because I, um, I just find education and finance really complicated. I thought you were going to say it was going to be interesting. Not interesting, but <laughs> very complicated. And I, and I um, always feel like I'm behind the eight ball. So I want to um, understand what's going on. And um, this year, as much as we have a lot of money, I worry about next year and the year after in particular. So uh, we are in a seesaw business. So any other reports? Okay, item 14, upcoming and new referral agenda items. Anybody have anything? Yes, Twin? Um, and maybe this could be in a Sunday report, but I'm just curious because we know that these last couple of years have taken a huge toll on our students and then also our, our teachers and staff. So I'm just wondering what kind of wellness programs we have for them, for our staff. It could be a Sunday report. Good. And anybody else? Okay. 15 announcements. The next regular meeting of the Board of Education will be held Thursday, June 16th, 2022. Closed session will begin at 5.30, followed by the regular meeting at 7 p.m. The agenda will be available on the district's website by 5 p.m. on Friday, June 9th. 